Hi nasta'inu ala umur dunia wa din wa salatu wa salamu ala syrafil anbiya wal mursalin Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Alhamdulillah for safari praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For giving us this ability to come to this uh, majlis In an effort for us to study the laws of marriage And this is one of the laws which is compulsory Upon every Muslim to study it when he or her is going to get married we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah make it easy upon us inshallah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open for us the doors of understanding so in the beginning I will straight away talk about the integrals of marriage the first few uh, first two pages you can read up on your own unless inshallah if you have time I will go back to it inshallah so we want to concentrate on the things which are compulsory so the main topics that we are going to talk today is three topics. Number one are the Arkanu uh, Nikah. These are the integrals any of uh, Nikah. The second topic is pertaining to Talaq, divorce. And the third topic is pertaining to Nafaqat. And the reason I choose these three topics because these are the topics which a lot of people ask. A lot of people nowadays ask about the Arkanu Nikah. They ask about the types of divorce and also pertaining to Nafaqat. So we will start off with uh, talking about the integrals of nikah, the arkan of nikah. Basically, when we say arkan of nikah, the things which are compulsory in the, in a marriage agreement, we are talking about the things that will make the nikah valid. If a person is uh, involved in a marriage agreement in akad, these are the things that we say that all of them must be present. If any of these integrals are not present. Then we say the nikah or the marriage agreement is not valid. Point number one, as mentioned here, <coughs> marriage has integrals which are five in number. So this is the first point that we have to understand. Altogether, we have five pillars. Just like in prayers, for example, if a person asks, how many integrals do you have in prayers? Our answer will be, our answer will be 13. So we say that these are the things which are compulsory upon us to perform them in prayers. If any one of the uh, integrals that we do not perform, then our prayers will not be valid. The same goes for nikah. We say that these are the five things which uh, validate the nikah. If any of these five things is not, uh, is not uh, present, or any of the conditions are not met, then we say that the whole process of nikah is not valid. So when the whole process of nikah is not valid, basically any, this is the issue that we are going to discuss in this particular class also inshallah the first point in the integrals of marriage is pertaining to ijab and kabul or we translate in english as a spoken form so for example if a person he wants to marry off his daughter to someone so in the arabic language we say zawajtuka ibnati i marry you off to my daughter so imagine any person he has a daughter so he is a guardian wali so he says, I marry you to my, I marry you to my daughter. This is what we call as ijab. And ijab, and it comes from the wali. And the person who accepts this marriage, he said, Qabil to I accept the marriage. It looks something which is simple. Ijab, any from the wali, and kabul, any from the, from the person, any who is going to get married, from the groom. So these are the basic essentials any in the spoken form. But of course there are a lot of conditions that comes into it. In Islam there is only two types of words which is uh, uh, permissible for us to use in a marriage agreement. And these are the two words that, that, that are mentioned in the Quran specifically. Word number one is tazwij. The word tazwij. And the second one is inkah. So either we say zawajtuka or we say ankahtuka. These are the only two words that can be used in a marriage agreement. And this is pertaining to the Arabic language. When we translate to any other languages, when we translate to English language or we translate to Malay, the translation has to come together with the meaning of these two words. So for example, if you ask what is the translation in English pertaining to zawajtuka or ankahtuka. So we say that the translation is I marry you. I marry you. Zawajtuka bi ibnati. I marry you to my daughter. So we say that this is a translation of the word tazwij and also the translation of the word inkah. So this is valid. In the Malay language, for example, 
It is a different translation. So in every language, we have to ascertain what is the correct translation of these two words, Tazwij and Inka. And no other word can be used to be replaced other than these two words. So this is point number. This is point number one. The conditions pertaining to this uh, Ijab and Kabul, if you look here, the next one, an immediate spoken acceptance by the groom, namely, I accept her marriage. When the wali says, Zawajtuka, or I marry you to my daughter, it is compulsory upon the groom to accept the marriage spontaneously. Spontaneously. So when he says, Zawajtuka, Ibn Ati, he says, Qabil tu tazwijaha. It is spontaneous. If the groom, for example, he delay. If the, if the wali said, I marry you off to my daughter. And then this groom, and he is thinking, whether am I going to accept this marriage or I am not going to accept this marriage. But after that, he made a decision. He said, I accept her marriage. We say this is not valid. We say the agreement is not valid. The reason why it is not valid because the response is not spontaneous. So, what you call it spontaneous in response, it is a condition in the validity any of the ijab and qabul and this is very important i would like to emphasize on this because there are some instances that you find in uh, aqad nikah what you will find that the person yani, who does the ijab he say i marry you off to my daughter or saya kahwinkan uh, anak uh, anak perempuan saya kepada fulan bin fulan and so on then what happen is there will be a transfer of microphone so the, the, the wali, for example, he say, I marry you off to my daughter, that, that someone and he will transfer the microphone and it to the groom. Now this is time. So it might take a few seconds. And then the groom will say, I accept the marriage. This happens any sometimes. And this is something that we have to be careful. So it has to be, it has to be spontaneous. If it is not spontaneous, it is not valid. So it is something any which is something which is important. Time. It is not interrupted with extra words that has nothing to do with the agreement. So if a person, for example, he say, I marry you off to my daughter. And then he said that, he said that, inshallah, if, uh, if, uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, I accept the marriage. Now we say, in this situation also, the marriage is not valid. Because in between the ijab and kabul, words that has got nothing to do with any with the, with the aqad. So we say that it is still not, it is not, still not valid. So it has to be spontaneous, it has to be transparent, it has to be clear. Everything and it has to be, has to be correct. It is not interrupted with a long silence, as what I mentioned. For example, if a person, any before accepting the marriage, he kept quiet maybe for five seconds. We say this is a long silence. So it shows there is some doubt any in a person. The wali and he say, I marry you off to my daughter, so he kept, kept quiet. He kept quiet maybe for five seconds. Then he said, I accept the marriage. We say it is not valid because it is interrupted with a long silence. Point number E, uh, point number e the spoken form meanings must coincide correctly with the agreements. So if the wali, for example, say, I marry you off to my daughter. And then he say, I accept the sale. Has nothing got to do with any with the marriage. So yesterday, I, I accept the marriage. This is, this is compulsory. So it must coincide any in the coincide in the meanings. No condition and time allowed is, is uh, no condition and time limit is allowed. So when we are doing ijab and kabul, there must be no condition. He cannot say that I accept the marriage when the sun set. It is not valid. Or I accept the marriage after one day. Time limit. It is also not. It is also not valid. It has to be heard by someone close. So it cannot be too soft. The two witnesses that is uh, witnessing the Akan Nikah is able to understand the language and he is able to hear what they are saying. Then only we say it is uh, valid. It has to be plain words, which is Tazwij and Inka, as what I mentioned in the beginning. Translation has to be based on these words. The witnesses have to hear and understand the spoken form of the marriage agreement. So this is pertaining to the spoken form. al ijab wal Qabul. I hope everything is clear, inshallah. Now we go on to the second integral of Nikah which is the shahidan, the two witnesses. So when we are doing this aqad nikah, it is compulsory that at least there must be two male witnesses who witness this agreement. And there are conditions pertaining to witnesses. Number one, they have to be male, not female. Number two, must be sound, the sound of hearing and he must be able to hear. Male witnesses are able to hear. So deaf witnesses cannot be taken into account. Sound of eyesight, able to see. 
familiar with the lang language of the two contacting parties. Imagine you have witnesses, you have two witnesses, they do not understand English. And then the Akad Nikah is performed in English. We say this, this marriage agreement is not valid. This marriage agreement is not valid because it is a condition that the witnesses, they have to understand the language when the spoken form is, is mentioned. They must be Muslims. They must be Muslims. Not Muslims, any not able, any to become witnesses in marriage. And they must be upright witnesses. Al-Adl. What is the meaning of upright witnesses? There are three conditions. Condition number one, a person who has not performed a major sin. A person who has not performed a major sin. Number two, a person who has not performed, who does not perform a minor sin continuously. A person who does not perform a minor sin continuously. This is not inside your notes, huh? I'm talking about the conditions and your shahidan, con conditions of witness. The conditions of witness there are three. Number one, as what I mentioned, that a person who has not performed a major sin. Number two, a person who does not perform a minor sin continuously. He does not perform minor sin continuously or daily. Point number three, he has not performed something that, uh, what you call it, critics his self-honor. He has not performed something that critics self-honor. Inshallah, when I have time, I will mention this, inshallah. Maybe after we finish any of this article, if there is any question pertaining to this, then you can ask. So they must be upright witnesses. If you have a witness, for example, Fasiq, the opposite of Adil, not an upright witness, meaning a person who has done a major sin, or a person who does minor sin continuously. Imagine you have a drunkard who become a witness. So we want to get married, for example, our best friend, but it happens and he, he becomes, he is a drunkard, Fasiq, a person and he who commits a major sin. In this particular situation, we say the Akanika is not valid because it is witnessed by witnesses who are not upright. So it has to be witnesses that are, that are upright. Those who does not perform prayers, for example. Those who does not perform the five-time daily prayers. Is this upright, not upright? We say this is not upright. Because not performing the five-time daily prayers is a major sin. So whenever a person who performs a major sin, we do not consider him to be adl. We do not consider him any to be an upright. So his witnesses, his witness, his witnessing is not valid. So when his witnessing is not valid, since witnessing is one of the integrals of nikah, we say that the nikah is also not, the nikah is also not valid. Toy. Now we go on to the third integral. That is the bride. Afwan, the bride's guardian, the wali. The marriage agreement is not valid without a guardian. So whenever a woman, for example, she wants to get married, the first thing, one of the first things that we ask, where is her guardian? So imagine any you are called the, and then a, woman's come, a woman comes to you and says, I want to get married. So we have to ask her, where is your guardian? Because in Islam, it is not permissible for a woman to engage in a marriage by herself. It is not permissible for a woman to engage in a marriage by herself. So there must be a guardian. So we ask about her guardian. And guardian of a woman can vary. Because there are a few uh, persons that can be the guardian. And all this, as what inshallah will be mentioned later in a sequence. The conditions of a guardian of a wali, he must be a male. No female any can become a wali, meaning become a guardian in nikah. So even if he, she has a mother, for example, it is not permissible any for the mother any to become, to become the wali. Number two is legally responsible, mukallaf. Mukallaf basically is a person who has reached puberty and a person who is sane. Point number one, puberty. Number two, he is sane. And number three, his, uh, what you call it, senses are, uh, his senses are intact. Senses are intact. This is the meaning of mukallaf. So, number one, a person any who has rich, puberty, a person who is sane, and a person any who is sensible. That is the word. This is the one we say as mukallaf. So, imagine if a person, if a woman, for example, she has a father, and the father is not a mukallaf. Meaning, for example, if the father is insane, a person any who is insane, we say that this particular person is not a mukallaf. When he is not a mukallaf, he cannot become, cannot become the wali. This is the example. 
He must be a Muslim, must be an upright person, not a fasiq. Again, we talk about the same situation, the same condition as what we mentioned pertaining to the witnesses. So the witnesses must be upright and the guardian also must be upright. The guardian also must be upright. And of sound judgment, this is what I mentioned earlier, any pertaining to mukallaf, meaning a person any who is sane, not a person who is insane. The following may not be a bride's guardian, a woman, a child or insane person, non-Muslim, because all these people, they are not mukallaf. A corrupt person, this is fasiq, the opposite of an upright person. And someone whose judgment is unsound because of old age and weak-mindedness. Imagine a person and who comes to a stage where he cannot think anymore. A person who is too old and he is not able to understand what he speaks or he is not too able to understand what people are speaking to him. So this particular person, if he has a daughter and the daughter wants to get married, he cannot become a wali because he does not understand the words that are spoken to him. So how can he understand pertaining to the Akad Nikah? How can he understand any Ijab and Kabul? So we are talking about upright guardian and also mukallaf a person who is a male and a person who is a Muslim, a person who is able and to understand spoken form of agreement. And then I go on to talk about the, uh, the steps or the degrees any of guardian. Who is the one who should be given the priority to become the wali of a woman who is going to get married? Number one is the father. So if a woman, for example, he wants to get married and the father is present, then the father is the guardian. And nobody can become the guardian in the presence of the father. Nobody. So even the brothers or even the sons, they cannot come and they say that I want to marry off any of my sister or I want to marry off any of my, my niece. If we say that the father is present, then only the father is given the authority to marry off the daughter. Unless if the father is not present. If the father is not present, then we go on to the next step. That is the father's father. This is the grandfather. So the thing here is, he is the father's father, not the mother's father. Not the mother's father. We are talking about Asabat. We are talking about male relatives that comes any to the father. All male relatives that go back any to the father, any of the, of the daughter. This is what we are saying pertaining to the guardian. So father's father can be a guardian if the father is not present. If the grandfather is not present also, then we go on to the next step, that is the brother. Whether we are talking about full brother or we are talking about half brother. But uh, preference or we say priority is given to the full brother. Number four is the brother's son. If the brother is not uh, present or the brother has passed away for example, then it goes back any to, the, to the brother's son. This is pertaining to the, this is pertaining any to the nephew. So the nephew yani, of a woman who is going to get married. So the nephew can become the wali if the father is not present, the grandfather is not present, and also the brother, then he can become the wali. And then he goes uh, to the father's brother. This is the uncle, paternal uncle. Paternal uncle also can become a guardian if all the above are not present. And then it goes back to the father's brother's son. This is one, cousin. So the cousin can become the guardian of a woman in a situation where all the awliya or all the wali are not, are not present. So none of the above may marry her to someone when a family member higher on the list exists. So maybe you can underline this. This is important. So we are talking about sequence here. So it is not a choice, huh? but it is based on, it is based on sequence. So the qadi, in, in the, the judge and in the mahkamah, when he sees this situation, a woman wants to get married, this is one of the first things that he has to establish. Who is the guardian? Who is the correct guardian of this particular, of the, this particular girl? Then only any we can talk about the other integrals. <coughs> if a guardian does not have the right to be guardian because of the existence of one of the above mentioned preventives, the guardianship devolves to the next family member in the order of lawful guardians. Uh, guardians that's what I mentioned. Now we go on to the fourth integral. That is the groom, the man. The conditions of the groom or the husband, number one, he must be willing, not forced. Meaning if a person is forced to get married, the marriage agreement is not, the marriage agreement is not valid. Number two, must be a male. Number three, knowing the exact bride for his marriage. So there should not be any confusion or any doubts pertaining to who am I going to get married, for example. 
If a person who is going to engage in a marriage and he does not know for sure who exactly and is the uh, is the bride, we say it is not valid. The marriage agreement is not valid. It's a non-mahram. After this, inshallah, we will talk about who are the mahram and who are the non-mahram. So when you want to engage in a marriage with a woman, for example, so this particular woman must not be one of your blood ties or even in foster relationship. That's what, inshallah, later we will, we will mention. It is permissible for him to select others in the acceptance of the marriage. Meaning it is permissible for someone to commission others for the acceptance yani, of the marriage agreement. This is, we say, as wakil. And this is permissible in the marriage contract. Now I will talk about the unmarriageable kin, that is mahram. Mahram is divided into two main categories. We have mahram which is forever and we have mahram which is tied yani, to time. And mahram yani, which is forever meaning it is you, you cannot at all marry such a woman forever. Number one it is mother. It is not permissible for a person to marry his mother. All of us know this. Number two, grandmothers, from his mother's or father's side and on up. Grandmother, mothers of the grandmother and so on and so on. Number three, daughters. And then the daughters of his children, children's children and on down. Sisters, whether full sisters or half sister. Number six, daughters or brothers or sisters, their children's daughters and on down. Number seven, mother's sisters, meaning these are the aunties. Whether it is paternal aunties or it is maternal aunties. It is not permissible for someone to engage in this marriage. Father, sisters. This is paternal aunties. Fathers, fathers, sisters and on up. Wives, mother. When a person marries any to a woman, the mother becomes the mother becomes his mahram. So this is forever. Forever. Meaning after even after divorce. After a person divorces his wife, the mother of his uh, last wife, uh, uh, the mother of the wife that in which he divorced is still within his mahram. Meaning he is, it is not permissible for him to marry the mother of the wife whom he has married, even though a divorce has taken place. Because this particular mahram is forever. The wife of his father, father's father and so on. It is not permissible for someone to marry the wife of his father. All of whom, number 9 to number 12, are unlawful for him to marry by the mere fact of marriage. So from point number 9 all the way to number 12, these are the mahram based on marriage. Meaning, mahram any is established any when, there is a, when there is marriage. Before that are basically mahram of blood ties. And all those considered as unmarriageable kin to him through his having been breastfed by a particular witness in infancy. Now we talk about this pertaining to foster relationship. Meaning a woman breastfeed someone, yani a, a, a son. So if all the conditions of breastfeeding are valid, we say that this particular son is considered mahram with the woman who is breastfeeding him. And when we say he becomes a mahram, everything as what we mentioned pertaining to the blood ties are applied. Everything is what we mentioned. So meaning the son of this woman or the daughter any of this woman who breastfeed any of this baby will become his mahram. We say that these are siblings in fostership. And the same thing pertaining to the aunties, the same thing any pertaining to the grandfather or grandmothers, and the same thing pertaining to the grandchildren. So everything is what we mentioned pertaining to the, uh, what you call it, the blood ties is applied in fostership. So this is the principle. It is unlawful or an invalid for a woman to marry her father, grandfather and honor. Just now we talk about the situation yani of the <coughs> we talk about the situation of the men. Now we talk about the situation yani of the woman. It is not permissible for her to marry the father, the son, the brother, the father's father, the, the father's brother, mother's brother. These are the, the paternal uncle and the maternal uncle, brother's son. Sister, son, the niece and nephew, the uh, the husband of her mother, grandmother and on up, her husband's father, grandfather and on up, and husband, son and descendants, and unmarriageable kin to her through her having been breastfed by a particular witness in infancy. So basically, it is the same as what we mentioned pertaining to the men. There is no difference. There is no difference. So I will just 
<coughs> go on and to the next point inshallah now we go on to talk about the second uh, category of mahram which is mahram that is combined mahram that is combined or we say mahram which we an allocated time it is tied with time meaning it is not permissible for us to marry such a woman at a specific time this is what we mention as mahram bil jama yani mahram when there is a combination as what uh, is mentioned here for example if a man marry a woman it is not permissible to marry the sister of his wife it is not permissible any to marry the sister of his wife if a man is engaged any marriage any with a woman and this woman has a sister we say that the sister it is not permissible for him to engage in a marriage it is not permissible for him to engage in a marriage with his sister as long as his wife is still within within his marriage unless if he divorce the wife and after she completed the idda then only it is permissible for her to marry the sister so we say that this is a type of mahram which is tied to time or there is a condition to it it is not forever it is not forever or we say that for example the wife passed away and after iddatul wafa after the idda any pertaining to the deceased then it is permissible any for this particular person to marry the sister any of his wife because why because the sister any has passed away upon the wife has passed away and the idda any has has completed then it is permissible so we say that this is an instance or an example of mahram which is tied any with condition or tied with time a woman and her father sister a woman and a father sister so the same thing as what we mentioned it is not permissible for a person to marry a woman and to marry her auntie from her father side or to marry her auntie from her mother side whether we are talking about paternal auntie or we are talking about maternal auntie it is not permissible or a woman and a mother sister so we mentioned but if a man is no longer married to one of the above and the waiting period idda has expired then he may marry the other as what i mentioned the same categories of relatives who are unlawful for one to marry because of one kinship relation to them are also unlawful to them to one by foster relationship this is pertaining to breastfeeding it carries any the same law as what we mentioned earlier it is unlawful for a muslim man to marry a zoroastrian woman an idol worshiper apostate from islam a woman with one parent who is jewish or christian while the other is zoroastrian in islam it is permissible for a man to marry ahlul kitab and ahlul kitab there are only two categories we have the jew jew and christian but there are a lot of conditions inshallah if there is time i will talk about the conditions pertaining to ahlul kitab and i would like to say that most of the christians today most of the christians i can say 99% it is not permissible for a muslim to marry them even though they are christians because if i were to talk about the conditions pertaining to the validity of the marriage of ahlul kitab you will find that most of the christians today they are not within these conditions so inshallah and even there is time i will talk about that but pertaining to jews we say most jews it is permissible any for us to marry them but it is makro it is makro but also any with with conditions it is unlawful to marry a woman who is in a state of pilgrim sanctity if a woman is state of ihram if she is doing ihram it is not permissible for a man to marry her unless if she has finished any the tahallul thani the second stage of tahallul it is unlawful for a free man to marry more than four women in islam it is permissible for a man to marry up to four women if a man engage in a marriage for the fifth woman it is not it is not valid and then we go on to talk about the bride he, she must be a female not in ihram for hajj and umrah not in any marriage it is not permissible for a man to marry a woman who is within a marriage not in idda inshallah later on we will talk about idda the different types of idda we have a few types of idda whether we are talking about iddatul wafa when her husband passed away or we are talking about iddatul talaq when her husband yani divorced the wife when she is still within the waiting period it is not permissible for anyone to marry that particular woman and not the fifth wife as what i mentioned earlier guardians who may marry a virgin to a man without her consent guardians there are two types we have guardians who is given the authority this point number 1 guardians who are given the authority to marry their daughters without her consent and these are only two types we have the father and the father's father only two person allah subhanahu wa taala gave them this 
permissibility that they are able and to, ma to, to marry of their daughter without, their, without the daughter's consent. And that is the father. father's father, there is no one that can marry off a woman without her, without her consent. But of course, there are conditions. Altogether, yeah, there are four conditions. Altogether, there are four conditions. Those who make a compel here are not entitled to marry her to someone unless she accepts and gives her permission. Other than the father, other than the father and the father's father, it is not permissible for a guardian to marry off a woman unless she gives her consent. Unless she gives her consent. So when we want to marry off, for example, a woman, if you are the Qadi, if you are the person who is given the responsibility to marry off someone, the, one of the things that we ask is if, for example, the father is not present and the father's father is also not present, if the one who is the guardian of the woman is other than the father or the father's father, the question that we have to ask is, does this woman give her permission for her to be married any to the person that we are going to, uh, what you call it, engage any in the, in the marriage? If the answer is no, then it is not permissible for any one of them to marry off this, to marry off this woman. Other than the father, and the father's father. Meaning, it is permissible then for the father to marry off the daughter without her consent, but with four conditions. And whenever the bride is a virgin, the father or father's father may marry her to someone without her permission, as what I mentioned. Though it is recommended to ask her permission if she has, she has reached puberty. Because woman who has not reached puberty, her consent is not valid. And also children who has not reached puberty, their consent is not valid. So it does not make sense if a woman who has not reached puberty and the father asks for her permission. Even if she gives permission, her permission is not valid because she is not a mukallaf, because she has not reached puberty. So if this woman who is a virgin and she has reached puberty, then it is a sunnah for the father to ask for her permission to marry her off. But we say it is a, it is a sunnah, not compulsory. If the father any marry her off without her permission, we say the marriage is valid with four conditions, inshallah, I will mention later. A virgin silence is considered as permission, as for non-virgin of sound mind. So now we are talking about two types of women here. Number one is a virgin, number two is not virgin. We have two rulings here. We say that it is permissible for a father or father's father to marry off a woman who is a virgin without her permission. This is point number one. Point number two. It is not permissible for a father or father's father to marry off a woman who is a non-virgin unless with her consent. So for non-virgin, it is not permissible for the father, even for the father or the father's father to marry her off unless she gives the permission. And we talk, when we talk about virginity, we are talking about consummation. When there is consummation, whether the woman is consummated in marriage or in zina, we say in this particular situation, she is considered to be a non-virgin. And when she wants to get married, it is compulsory that her consent must be given before she is married off to anyone. Toy. And then we talk about the kafa'a. One of the conditions that a father can marry off the daughter is there must be kafa'a. So I will give you one example. Imagine that you have a father, the daughter has not reached puberty, and the father wants to marry off the daughter to a man. We say there must be four conditions. There must be four conditions. So I will quickly uh, tell you these four conditions and then I will talk about kafa'a. The condition any number one is that the dowry must be in accordance to her standard. The dowry must be in accordance to the standard. How do we know that the, dow the dowry, whether it is in accordance any to the standard any of this girl or not to the standard of this girl. So we have to look at the relatives. The relatives of this girl. For example, the aunties. The aunties, when, her aunties, when, when they, they got married, what is the amount of the dowry that is paid? So we must reach any to a certain stage where we say that this is the standard any of the dowry where her relatives any got married. So when the father is marrying her off and she, she has not any rich puberty, and she is a virgin, and the father marry her off without her permission. The point number one that we are talking about is pertaining to the dowry, that he has to reach the standard any of her status. This is point number one. So the father cannot reduce the dowry too low, 
that it is against the yani, standard of the status yani, of, the, of the girl. This is point number one. Point number two, there must be no enmity between the husband, between the future husband and this girl. There must be no enmity. Point number three, there must be no enmity between the guardian himself and the girl. There, be, there must be no enmity between the guardian and the girl. Point number four, there must be kafa'a. And this is what we are going to talk about pertaining to kafa'a. So all together there are, there are four conditions. These are the conditions pertaining to the permissibility of a father or the father's father to marry off the daughter without her permission. But she must be a virgin. Non-virgin, we, we do not talk about all this. We do not talk about all this condition. Because pertaining to non-virgin, there must be permission any from her side. Five. We say point number four, there must be kafa. What is kafa? So he said, no guardian may marry a woman to someone who is not suitable a match without her acceptance and the acceptance of all who can be guardians. If the Islamic magistrate is a guardian, he may not under any circumstances marry her to someone who is not suitable a match for her. So when we talk about kafa'a, we are talking about a suitable match. And suitable match concerns lineage. Number one, religiousness, profession, and being free from defects that permit annulling the marriage contract. So I give you an example. It is not permissible for a father to marry, her, marry the daughter to someone who is not suitable to her. So now we are talking about marriage without the permission any of the daughter. So we say that it is not permissible any for the father to marry, marry off his daughter without finding a suitable match. So imagine if this particular girl is known for her lineage of a particular family. It is not permissible for the father to marry her off to a man who is lower in lineage than her. And uh, a lot of questions that we, 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 we see nowadays in our society in Singapore, the question pertaining to is it permissible for a man to marry a woman who is from the descendant of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we, we are living in a society where we come across the descendant of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the name of Sharifah. So people ask, is it permissible for a man, for example, other than the Arabs or within the, Arab, within the Arabs themselves to marry such a woman? We say that if this particular woman, if this particular woman is married off by her father without her permission and she is a virgin, then we say kafa'a is compulsory. Kafa'a is compulsory, meaning the father cannot marry her off to someone who is not the same as her lineage. If the father does that, the marriage is not valid. Unless, unless, if she agrees, if she agrees, but the condition is she must have reached puberty. If a person, for example, you have a Sharifa, she has reached puberty and she wants to get married any to a person other than the Arabs and the father asks for her permission and she say, I want to marry him, no matter what, no matter what race any he can be. Then only we say it is permissible for the father any to marry her off. But we are talking here, when we talk about kafa'a, we are talking in a situation when the father marry her off without her consent. And this is pertaining to the other, we are talking about a woman who has not reached puberty, a virgin who has not reached puberty, or a virgin who has reached puberty. If the father wants to marry her off, the father must make sure that the man who is going to marry the, to his daughter must be the same as the lineage. The profession, the profession must be the same level as the family of this girl. Imagine if a girl is from the families or ministers in a country. The father cannot marry her off to a person who is a road sweeper, for example. It is not permissible. It is not permissible. Some of you, you might say that is this discrimination, racial discrimination or what? We say that this is not a racial discrimination. But we are talking about the maslaha of the woman. Because this particular woman, when she grows up and she got to know that the father married her off to a road sweeper, there will be problems in the future. That is why Islam put these rulings. That is why Islam put these rulings. We must understand it is for the maslaha of the woman. That is why we say that it is permissible for the father to marry her off if she has reached puberty with her permission. Because this is her maslaha. It is not the maslaha any from the, not maslaha from the father. Then only if the, the permission is given by the woman with the condition she has reached puberty, then only the father can marry her off to a, to, to, to a man who is not within the same kafa'a as the woman. I hope this is clear, inshallah. Now we go on yani, to, the next, to the next point. Inshallah, if you have any question, what you can do, write down. Inshallah, 12.15, we have Q&A. Anything that you do not understand, inshallah, that needs clarification. 
But I hope, but I hope you will ask questions based on what we have discussed today. Because time is precious, ya jama. Time is very precious. So do not ask questions pertaining to faraid. Do not ask questions any pertaining to things we just not have involved in any of these things that we are mentioning because we want to save time and we want to get as much as benefit as possible. Toy. Now the next one we talk about the marriage payment, the mahal. <coughs> it is a sunnah to name the amount of the marriage payment in a marriage agreement. Now the, the first thing that we have to understand that mahal, that the marriage uh, payment is not part of the integrals. It's not part of the integrals. But we say that it is compulsory. So do not be confused. Do not be confused. When we say that the mahar is not within the integrals, meaning we say that if you have a marriage agreement and the mahar is not mentioned in the agreement, for example, a father marries a daughter and says, Zawaj tuka ibnati, or I marry you off to my daughter, without mentioning how much is a dowry. And the man say, I accept the marriage. We say this particular marriage is valid. But what is a dowry now? Where is dowry? We say even though the dowry is not mentioned in the agreement, it does not matter. It does not matter. We say it is a sunnah. It is a sunnah for us to mention the dowry in the akad. But the instance that the dowry is not mentioned, we say that the agreement is valid. The agreement is valid, but it is compulsory upon the husband to pay the mahal to the woman if the mahal is not specified then again we have to look at the at the mahal of her sisters or the mahal any of her relatives and then the judge the judge or the qadi will come and to a conclusion to determine how much is the mahal of this particular girl this is in arabic we say mahal mithli it is a what you call it judge form of uh, dowry this in, in, in the instance, if this dowry is not mentioned, the amount is not mentioned any in the, in the agreement. So we say dowry is compulsory. Dowry is compulsory. So a guardian may not marry his small, not rich puberty daughter to someone for less than the amount typically received as marriage payment by similar brides. This is what I mentioned any earlier pertaining to the conditions of kafa'a. So if a man wants to marry off the daughter, and the daughter has not reached puberty, so the father wants to marry her off, in this particular situation, it is, it is a, it's compulsory that the dowry cannot be less than the mahar mithal. Otherwise, the marriage is not valid. And then we go down a bit. If payable immediately, the bride may refuse to have sexual intercourse until the husband gives her her marriage payment. You see, the thing about mahar, if this uh, dowry is mentioned in the akhat, if it is mentioned, I marry you off to my daughter, for 1,000 Singapore dollars, for example, or for a gold ring, and so on. So we say that it is compulsory upon the husband to pay this uh, woman the said dowry. And the woman may choose to reject the husband in performing sexual intercourse if the husband has not paid this particular dowry. But in the event that consummation has already occurs, if in the event of consummation already occurs, then she cannot refuse the husband from any form of sexual intercourse. Taib. It is, uh, it, it, she is not entitled to any of the marriage payment. If the couple is separated, now we get this line. If the couple is separated by having annulled the marriage before intercourse because of an act of, on the bride's part, as when she becomes a Muslim and the husband remains non Muslim or she leaves Islam and the husband remains Muslim, then she is not entitled to any of the marriage payment. But if it is because of an act on the husband's part, as when he becomes a Muslim, or leaves Islam or divorce, then she receives only half of the marriage payment. Now, this is a situation now. I will mention extensively, inshallah, when we go into the chapter of Talaq. Imagine you have a woman who gets married, and then she is divorced, or the judge annulled the marriage before consummation if the judge annulled the marriage because of consummation for example as what is mentioned here the woman apostate meaning she leaves islam imagine a man marries a woman and before consummation the woman leaves islam in this particular situation it is compulsory upon the judge to annul the marriage meaning the marriage can no longer no longer any be no longer be valid 
In this particular situation, we say that she is not entitled to get the mahar. She is not entitled to get the payment. Why is he not entitled to get the payment? Because it is because of her fault. Because she opposed it. So she is not entitled. Point number two is because there is no consummation. When there is no consummation, she is not entitled any to the mahar. So this is the first situation. The second situation, for example, if a woman marries any to a man and there is no consummation, if there is no consummation and then the man divorced the woman, the man divorced the woman. In this particular situation, we say that she is entitled to half of the mahar. She is entitled to half of the to half of the mahar. So this is what is mentioned as mentioned here. So sometimes any the marriage payment is not entitled to her. Sometimes she is only entitled to half of the mahar, and sometimes she is entitled to receive the full payment. The the example that she is entitled to receive any the full payment if the husband consummate with her. Meaning the husband, husband yani got married and then after that they consummated. In this particular situation, the the payment, yani mahar, now become hers fully. If the husband divorced the woman after consummation, then it is not permissible for him to take back any the, the marriage payment because the marriage payment is now is uh, belongs any to the to the wife. And it is compulsory upon him also to pray the mut'atu talaq, in which inshallah any the topic will come will come later so i will skip any this uh, the amount typically received basically as what i mentioned we follow the sisters or we follow the relatives and then we come to a conclusion on how we can ascertain how much is the suitable amount of marriage payment any for this particular woman that is pertaining to mahal misal as what we mentioned now i will talk about mut'atu talaq so this is in a situation where a husband divorced the wife. The husband di divorced the wife. There are two situations. The first situation is husband divorced the wife before consummation. That's what I mentioned earlier. This is the first situation. The second situation is a husband who divorced the wife after consummation. These are two different situations with two different rulings. Because now we are talking about mut'atu talaq. Mut'atu talaq is basically the payment that the husband gives to the wife after divorce. The payment that the husband gives to the wife after divorce. Do not be confused with mut'atu talaq and mahar. These are two different things. Earlier we are talking about the marriage payment. Now we are talking about something else. Now we are talking about the mut'atu talaq. Meaning this is payment that is given to the wife after divorce. When mahar, we are talking about we are talking about the marriage agreement. So these are two different things. So the first situation is a woman who got married to a man and she is divorced before consummation. The second situation is she is divorced after consummation. If she is divorced, if she is divorced before consummation and this divorce is from the husband, meaning it has got nothing to do, to do with the wife, meaning the wife is still a Muslim. Earlier I gave the example the wife became an apostate. But in this situation, we say if the wife, if the divorce took place, not because of the wife, because of the husband, because the husband feels that he does not want, no longer any wants to be with this woman, for example. So he divorced any the wife. So now the divorce is from him. So if this particular divorce takes place and there is no consummation, this particular woman is entitled to half of the marriage payment, as what we mentioned. And there is no mut'atu talaq. There is no mut'atu talaq. Maybe you can write this down. This, the situation is a woman who is divorced without, without consummation, any before consummation. She is entitled to half of the marriage payment of the mahar. She is entitled to half of the dowry. And there is no mut'atu talaq. There is no payment because of divorce. So this is situation number one. Situation number two is a woman who is divorced by the husband after consummation. So there is consummation, meaning there is sexual intercourse. After the akad nikah, there is sexual intercourse, consummation. In this particular situation, if the husband divorce the wife, then there are two things which is compulsory upon the woman. Point number one, the woman is entitled the full payment of mahar, the full payment of dowry. If the dowry is 1,000 Singapore dollars, 1,000 Singapore dollars automatically will be given to her at the point of divorce. 
At the point of divorce, it is hers. Meaning, it is not permissible for the husband to take the dowry. The dowry, any full payment has to be paid to the, to the wife. This is point number one. Point number two, we say that it is compulsory upon the husband to pay the amnity payment. This is the mut'atu talaq. That's what we mentioned here. And mut'atu talaq, the amount of mut'atu talaq differs pertaining to the capacity of the husband. If the husband is a rich man, then the judge will, will uh, what you call it, estimate the amount of amnity payment that is going to be given to the, to the bride, yani to the woman. So we say that this form of amnity payment, this form of mut'atu talaq is compulsory upon the, upon the husband. If in a case where there is consummation, so you have to remember this, when there is consummation, then only mut'atu talaq is compulsory and the divorce is from the husband. The divorce is from the husband, meaning it is not because of the wife. It is not that the wife has apostate or the wife has a serious illness in which the, ju the judge has to annul the marriage. Then we say it is compulsory for the husband to pay the mut'atu talaq. Now we go on to talk about the chapter of divorce. So inshallah, can all of you digest? This is a real crash course, huh? I think so. But never mind. I hope that this is not going to be our last session, inshallah. I'm looking forward to, uh, to do more sessions. More sessions. Because uh, when, I, uh, when I started I need to do my notes, when I look at my notes, I got a, bit, a little bit worried. Because some of you might be the first time any learning this particular chapter. And then suddenly and you are bombarded and with all these technicalities, it might be difficult for a beginner. This is my concern. But since any I have already advertised, so I told myself that no, no choice any we have to we have to go through any this this difficulty. But inshallah I need your feedbacks. So what you can do is you can give us your feedbacks and then we will look into this matter. If there are certain areas that we feel that there must be more time to elaborate because it is difficult that I need to digest or difficult to understand, inform us. Inshallah we will arrange for something maybe inshallah in the future. So this is what any we are we are planning. So do not be disappointed, inshallah. If you can understand maybe 10%, alhamdulillah, 10% of what I mentioned, we say at least anyway, there is at least there is benefit. So now we will go into the chapter of divorce. This is the chapter which is I would like to focus on. The reason is because I find that a lot of people in our society are confused pertaining to divorce. So I feel that this is compulsory, this compulsory upon us yeah, need to really understand this particular topic. Because when we are dealing any with divorce, we are dealing about things which are very, very crucial and in our religion. So a lot of questions and it comes any pertaining to pertaining to this topic. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these few minutes that we have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy, inshallah. So divorce they are integrals. Just like when we say marriage agreement, they are integrals. Rukun. So in order for a divorce to take place, also there is, there is Rukun. They are integrals. If any of these integrals are not present, then the divorce is not valid. So these are the five integrals. But the thing is, I will not go too much talking about these integrals. I will talk about something else later you will see. So the integrals, any they are, they are five. Number one is a spoken form. Number two is the wife and the condition any of the wife. The authority any to affect it. The intention, because certain type of divorce there must be intention. And the person who affects it. Whether it is from the husband or it is from the magistrate. Not only the husband any entitled any for divorce. Sometimes any the kaldi, the judge, he is entitled any to divorce a marriage with the conditions. The divorce is not valid, number one, if it comes any from a child. So imagine you have a person who has not reached puberty and he got married. He engaged any in a, he engaged any in marriage. And then we say that it is not permissible any for him to do a divorce. Because why he has not reached puberty. This is point number one. Point number two, divorce is not valid for someone who is insane. So a person yani, must be sane. 
so that any if he were to say a divorce then only the divorce becomes valid number three the person who does a divorce must not be forced he must not be in a situation a person comes to him and he to and point a gun at him and say if you don't divorce your wife i will kill you so he say i divorce my wife this particular divorce is not is not valid and then there is an exception a statement of divorce is legally effective when pronounced by a person whose mental fac faculties are lacking because of something inexcusable such as having become intoxicated or having needlessly taken some mind altering drug though someone who takes a drug out of need for medical treatment is considered as an insane person in that his statement of divorce is not legally effective what the author is trying to say the author here is Ibn Naqib al-Misri I forgot to inform you that this notes is from Reliance of the Traveller meaning I, I, I do not take 100% any from Reliance of the Traveller but I take part of the Reliance of the Traveller most of the things that you are seeing here is from Reliance of the Traveller written by Ibn Naqib al-Misri this particular notes I took any from four books Umdatu Salik, Reliance of the Traveller and then I also take from Minhaj Talibin, Imam Nawawi and then the commentary of Minhaj, Murnil Muhtaj, Khatib Sharbini and then the other book is Kitabul Miftah written by Habib Muhammad bin Salib bin Hafiz the father of Habib Umar these are the four books and inshallah make dua we are in our effort and need to compile uh, a proper uh, notes as for our courses and in the future inshallah Taib. now the situation is like this we mentioned that talaq, divorce is not valid if a person is intoxicated if a person is insane but there are certain cases that talaq is valid by an intoxicated person if this person who is intoxicated he purposely make himself intoxicated if, for example a person who purposely drink liquor and then he became intoxicated and in this particular situation he divorced his wife we say that this particular situation the divorce is valid even though we say that he is intoxicated why do we say it is valid because this form of intoxication is not excusable but if a person is intoxicated because of medication he is sick he goes to the doctor and the doctor injected something into him and he became intoxicated in a way that he does not understand what he say and then he divorced his wife in this particular situation we say that the divorce does not take place the divorce does not take place because he is considered to be a person who is insane meaning a person who senses any cannot be cannot be function and then now we talk about the words that affect a divorce so this is the main topic this is the main topic the words that affect a divorce so you have to pay attention here the words that affect a divorce that affect a divorce is divided into two types the word that affects a divorce is divided into two types you have to underline these two the first type is number one is plain p l a i n so i put down there the words that affect a divorce may be plain or elusive so maybe you underline plain and you put one on top and you underline elusive and you put number two on top so it must be it is either plain or elusive and this is very important for us to understand if a person does not understand this he does not understand the chapter of talaq you you can you can read any everything any about kitabun nikah but if you do not understand any about about what is the uh, uh, words any which are plain or elusive you do not understand any what is what is the pertaining uh, things any that has got to do with divorce when we say plain words plain words in divorce there is only three and there is no fourth word only three only as what imam now we mentioned in minhaj so i quoted any what imam now we mentioned in this minhaj so basically the translation of what you see in the arabic he is saying that plain words in divorce are only three number one is talaq number two is firaq number three is sarah that's what you see so in the arabic language in the arabic language we say that only these three words that if a husband use it to divorce the wife automatically the wife become divorced even though the husband has no intention so imagine the husband has no intention to divorce the wife but it so happened that he say talaqtuka or talaqtuki 
He used the word talaq. Or in, if we translate it into English, I divorce you. If a husband and he say to the wife, I divorce you, this is considered to be plain words because it cannot have room for any interpretation. In this particular situation, even though the husband say, actually, I do not intend to divorce my wife. Husband say, I do not intend to divorce my wife. Or the husband say, actually, I forgot. Or the husband, uh, husband say, I was sleepy and I woke up from my sleep and I say, I divorce you. So does, does the divorce take place or it does not take place? In this particular situation, we say the divorce takes place. Even though the husband say, I got no intention. Even though the husband say, I forgot. Even though the husband say, I am sleepy. So it go, all goes back any, to, the, to the conditions any of the, how the divorce takes place as earlier as what we mentioned. The husband must be seen, not intoxicated. Tamam. The husband any, cannot be forced. If there is force, then the divorce any, is not valid. The, the husband must be mukallaf, not a small, small child, meaning has reached puberty and has understand any, what he is saying. Then if the divorce takes place in a form of plain words, of talaq, of firaq, of sarah, and the translation, I, divorce, in English I can only think any of this word divorce. Because the Arabic language, not all words and you can translate any to the English language. So the word divorce is considered as plain words. So if it is plain words, then we say the divorce takes place even without the intention of the husband. So this is a point that you have to put at the back of your mind. As we, I am going through this topic any of talaq. So I mentioned any in bold, plain words affect the divorce whether one intends divorce by them or not. While elusive words, now we talk about elusive words. While elusive words do not affect it unless one intends divorce by them. So this is the difference between plain words and elusive words. In Arabic, we say sarih and kinaya. Plain words, we say sarih, kinaya, uh, elusive words, we say kinaya. When we say elusive words, what we are meaning is these are words that does not give a direct meaning of divorce. It is a bit metaphorical. Or it is a bit words that is not direct. So I give some, Ibn Nakib, give some, some examples. For example, Husband saying, you are now alone. Imagine the husband and he say to the wife, the husband now, what you call is angry, for example. The wife and he does not obey him. So the, the husband and he in a state of anger, instead of saying, I di divorce you, he say, you are now alone. So now the question that we ask, when the husband say, you are now alone, is this divorce or not a divorce? Point number one, we understand that when he say, you are not alone, uh, you are alone, in this particular situation, we say these are not plain words. These are elusive words because it is not direct. It is not talking about divorce. When he say you are now alone, it can have implication. Meaning maybe the husband say you are now alone, maybe you are now alone in your room. For example, or you are now alone in the house. I'm, I'm going overseas, for example. So it has implication. When there is an implication, we say these are elusive words. And elusive words, when they are used in divorce, the divorce can only take place when there is intention. So if the husband say to the wife, you are now alone, and he intend divorce, then we say the divorce take place. But if he does not intend divorce, maybe in a state of anger, he say, you are now alone. But we ask him, do you intend divorce? He say, no, I did not intend divorce. Because I'm angry with my wife, that's why I say this. So we say that the divorce does not take place. Because why? Because there is no, there is no intention. And pertaining to elusive words, we have so many. We have hundreds of them. Pertaining to plain words, we have only three. But elusive word, if a poet and he comes to you, he can tell you yani, hundreds yani, of, of ways that a person yani, can say to a wife in the form of elusive meanings. So whether a person say, you are now alone. And then he gave some uh, other example. Rejoin your kin. You are no longer lawful to me. You are footloose. Go back to your father's house, for example. Sometimes in husband say like that. You go out of my house, for example. In this particular situation, we say that divorce can take place if he, mean, if he meant divorce, if there is an intention. If there is no intention, there is no, there is no divorce. So this is important. Huh? This is important because a lot of people ask this question. Fulan bin Fulan and he say this, such and such a word and he to the wife. So you as a person who is going to answer, you have to ascertain whether the words used by this particular person, is it plain words or elusive words? Is it plain words or elusive words? So we have to understand. So what is easy upon us to, to understand is 
Just memorize the plain words. It's easy. Because if you understand the plain words, other than the plain words are all elusive. So what are the plain words? The plain words is talaq. Uh, if a person say talaq, or a person say use the word firaq, or a person use sarah, or that is translation, then only we say that these are plain words. Other than that, everything is elusive. So we can solve a lot of problems any that is occurring any outside. Sometimes any a person use elusive words, he does not know that he, he wants to divorce his wife, but he uses elusive, elusive words. He thought that this is not divorce, but actually it is divorce. A lot of people do not know this. So this is a danger here. Because when, when divorce take, take place and a person doesn't know that it is divorce, what happens? Then he falls into zina for the whole life. And when he gets children, the children yani, will be born out of wedlock. Because why? The divorce has already taken place, but the fact that this particular person yani, is ignorant. This is happening yani, in our society. So we are, it becomes yani, a big problem. Man. If, you, if a person does not understand the rulings of divorce, it can be a big problem in his marriage because he might say something which he assumes it is not divorce, but actually it is divorce. That is why we say it is compulsory upon everyone who wants to engage in marriage to learn this particular chapter. It is compulsory. We are not talking that you learn the chapter of divorce. We are not talking that you are going to divorce any of your wife. But we are talking about to understand, to differentiate between whether a divorce takes place or the divorce does not take place. Because it is something which is, which is crucial. Right. Inshallah, if I have time, I will give you some examples based on my personal experience in this particular mosque when I receive any calls pertaining to this topic. Sometimes any, I'm amazed, any, wallahi. And it, you know, you get goosebumps sometimes when you, when you hear anything's happening any outside. Well, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us, inshallah. We will go on any, to talk about the general prov uh, provisions con concerning divorce. What is divorce? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Surah Al-Baqarah. This is the, the, the verse that is the basis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned At-talaqu maratan fa'imsatum bima'rufin aw tasrihun bihsan This is one of the foundations pertaining to the pertaining to the rulings of divorce. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned divorce is twice. Meaning a free man is given three counts of divorce. After three counts of divorce, it is not permissible for the man to ask the wife back to his marriage. So three counts of divorce is the maximum with the dalil of the Quran. Then Allah mentioned, then either keep her in an acceptable manner, meaning you take her back, would you? Or release her with good treatment. So this is what is mentioned here. There are various categories of divorce. So, the verse mentioned that there are altogether how many counts? Three counts of divorce. So, this is point number one. Point number two, Ibn Naqib al Misri, and he talked about what are the types of divorce? What are the types of divorce? So, he said that the types of divorce, the categories of divorce, they are of three types. Number one, it is called the Sunnah, the Sunnah divorce. Or we say, Talaq as Sunni. Talaq as Sunni. Number two is Talaqul Bidi. It is unlawful and innovation. Unlawful type of divorce. Number three, we have neither Sunnah nor unlawful innovation. La Sunnah wa la Bida'ah. So altogether, any we have three types. The Sunnah, the innovation, and neither Sunnah nor innovation. These are the three types of divorce. What is the meaning of the sunnah divorce? So he said here, point number one. The sunnah is to make a pronouncement of divorce in an interval between menstruation in which no sexual intercourse with the wife has taken place. The sunnah in divorce, for example, if a man wants to divorce the wife, we say that it is compulsory upon him to divorce the wife in the interval between menses in which he has not performed any sexual intercourse with the wife. This is a form of talaq sunni We say this is divorce which is sunnah. Meaning a person divorce the wife in an interval between menses in which he has not performed any sexual intercourse. So this is point number one. Point number two, the unlawful type of divorce. This is in a case if a person divorce the wife while the wife is in menses. Some of you learn about the rulings on menses. We say one of the things which is Haram upon the husband is to divorce the wife while the wife is in menses because it will prolong the waiting period. It will prolong the edda. That is why we say it is 
haram. So this type of talaq, we say talaqul bid'i. It is an innovation which is haram. But the talaq takes place. We say that it is not permissible that a husband divorce the wife while the wife is in menses. But we say the divorce takes place. But it is sinful upon the husband. Because the husband is causing injustice to the wife by prolonging the iddah. So this is talaq al-bid'i. The, the, another example of talaq al-bid'i is a person who divorced the wife in the interval between two menses, but he has consummated, meaning he has had sexual intercourse with the wife while in that interval. If he divorced her in that particular interval, it is also haram upon him. It is sinful upon him, but again we say in both instances, the talaq is valid, but it is uh, not permissible, any, uh, it is haram upon him. And then we have the situation where talaq, which is not a sunnah and also not bid'ah. It is not a sunnah and also not unlawful. This is in a case if a person divorced the wife, a, person, a wife who is undergoing menopause, meaning no, what you call it, no menses. So imagine if the wife is undergoing any menopause. The wife has no menses. In this particular situation, we do not talk about whether the talaq is sunnah or the talaq, of bid, uh, uh, talaq is bid'ah. Because why? Because this particular situation, the wife does not have any menses. So, when the husband divorced the wife, this particular type of divorce, it is neither sunnah and it is neither bid'ah. So, it is uh, what you call it, uh, talaq, which is neither sunnah and neither bid'ah. Now, <clears throat> and then uh, we go on and need to talk about divorce with release for payment. The divorce... Earlier we mentioned the rulings, whether it is sunnah or it is bid'i or it is not a sunnah and not a bid'i. These are the rulings. And then now, when we talk about the nature yani, of talaq, we talk about the nature of talaq. Talaq in its nature is divided into two parts. Talaq is divided into two parts. The first part of talaq is talaq, divorce, with a release of payment. That's what we are going into here. Divorce with release for payment. This is the first part any of the talaq. And then we have talaq without any release of payment. Later on, if you look at page 22, you will see the, you will see the diagram. I, I did a diagram for easier reference, inshallah. So before we go to the diagram, I will just explain and then after that inshallah you will have a clearer picture so basically there are two, two types any of talaq we have the talaq with payment okay talaq with payment and the second one is talaq without payment talaq with payment is what we are, we are, we are going to talk here it is called khul'u kha lam ain meaning the wife offer the wife offer the husband a certain amount of money or anything which is valuable with the condition that the husband divorce her so in a situation that the wife feel that she is unable to obey the husband and she, she fear that if this particular marriage goes on she will commit a lot of uh, what you call disobedience to the husband because in the first place she is not attracted any to this man such cases happen in our society a woman yani, married yani, to someone and then she found out that actually she cannot yani, live at all yani, with this particular person. And she feared that if this particular marriage prolong, there will be no happiness and she will live in a situation where she will always disobey yani, this particular person. So she feared for herself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In this particular situation, it is permissible for her to tell the husband that I will give you a certain amount of money with the condition that you divorce me. Now this particular, if the husband agrees and the, the husband and he divorced the wife with, by mentioning a certain amount of money, this is where we are going into. We are talking that this particular form of divorce is called khulu' and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. So he said, At-talaqu maratan, the same verse, fa'imsaakum bima'rufin aw tasrihun bi'ihsan wa la yahillu lakum an ta'khudhu mimma ataytumuhunna shay'a illa an yakhafa alla yuqima hudud Allah. فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا يُقِيمَ حُرُودَ اللَّهِ فَلَا جُنَاهَ عَلَيْهِمَا فِي مَفْتَدَتْ بِهِ تِلْكَ حُرُودُ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَعْتَدُوهَا وَمَنْ يَتَعَدَّ حُرُودَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ 
These are the rulings pertaining to the divorce of Khulu. Allah mentioned divorces twice. Then either keep her in an acceptable manner or release her with good treatment. And it is not unlawful for you to take anything of what you have given them. Unless both fear that they will not be able to keep within the limits of Allah. As what I mentioned earlier. If in, in a state of the, the woman unable to keep within the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also for the husband. If the husband agrees and feels that this marriage cannot go on. Uh, if it go, go on, we cannot be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the purpose of marriage is how we can be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because marriage is ibadah. But in a situation that marriage cannot be form of ibadah. But it becomes any the form of disobedience towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then it is permissible any upon the wife any to tell the husband yani, that she is willing yani, to give part of her wealth. Or part any of anything that is valuable to the husband with the condition that the husband, what you call it, release her. So this is what is mentioned here. But if you fear that they will not keep within the limits of Allah. Then there is no blame upon either of them concerning, concerning that by which she ransomed herself. So maybe you can underline this. By which she ransomed herself. This is the basis for talaq al khulu The talaq any for, for payment as what we mentioned. They are, these are the limits of Allah so do not transgress them and whoever transgress the limits of Allah it is those who are the wrongdoers. So we start by uh, explaining from page 5 from where we stopped earlier. So here we are going to mention about the doubts pertaining to the fact of having divorce. This is in a situation if a husband uh, has doubts whether has he divorced his wife or not. So how do we solve this situation? If a husband uh, say for example uh, he is in doubt that he has divorced his wife. In this situation we say he has not divorced his wife. Because there is a principle in fiqh la yazulu bil yaqeen. When you have doubt the doubts cannot overrule conviction, cannot rule yakin. So initially, he has not divorced his wife. So the divorcing is something that comes later. So when he has doubt in something any that comes later, and he has conviction with something that comes before, then the conviction overpowers any the doubt. So in this particular situation, we say that there is no divorce. So I repeat, in a situation that the husband is in doubt, as to whether he has divorced his wife or not. In this situation, we say he has not divorced his wife. But our scholars in the dimension, it is recommended. It is recommended for him to take back the wife. Meaning to take back the wife to his marriage. This is Ruju. Because why? Because this is just any to play safe. There, there is a possibility that he might divorce. There is a possibility he might divorce. But even though we say that there is no divorce that takes place, but we say that it is a sunnah for him to ask the wife back to his to his marriage. So this is the first situation. The second situation that is mentioned here, if a person is in doubt pertaining to the number of divorce, number of divorce, meaning he said that I do not know whether I have divorced my wife two times, but I am convinced that I have divorced her once, but I do not know for the second time, did I divorce the second time or I do not divorce the second time. In this particular situation, we say that the divorce is only once. Just the same many pertaining to prayers. If you pray three, four rakah, any of Zohar, if you are in the third rakah and then you are in doubt whether I, have you performed second account or third account, you have to take the less account. The same thing pertaining to divorce. A person and is in doubt whether he has divorced two times or one time. Whether he has divorced two times and one time. He is convinced that he has divorced one time. But the second time he is in doubt. In this particular situation, we say that he has divorced only once and not twice. This is some of the things that is mentioned here. So now we go on to the next one. That is the chapter of Raja. The chapter of Raja wa Ruju. This is a chapter in a case that if a husband divorced the wife, the husband di divorced a wife, and this particular marriage is a marriage that has been consummated. This is an important point here. Because divorce, if there is no consummation, if a husband divorced the wife without any consummation, without any sexual intercourse, in this particular situation, we say there is no idda. When we say there is no idda, there is no raja'a. Meaning it is not permissible for the husband to ask the wife back into his marriage. If in the situation that there is no consummation in the marriage. But if there is consummation, this is where we are going to talk about. 
Imagine a person, for example, got married yani, to a woman and they consummated the marriage. And then the man divorced the wife. The man divorced the wife. In this particular situation, we say that it is different from khulu, as what we mentioned earlier. It is not khulu. Khulu is the, what you call it, the husband asked for a certain amount of money. And the wife agreed to it. Then we say that that is a form of khulu. Divorce, that is the, the type of khulu that also it is not permissible for a husband to ask the wife back to his marriage pertaining to khulu. But other than khulu, with the condition as what I mentioned earlier that the marriage has been consummated, then in this particular situation, if the husband divorced the wife, the wife is in iddah, iddah to talaq. And if the wife is in this particular waiting period, which is called as iddah to talaq, it is permissible for the husband to ask the wife back to his marriage. This asking back to his marriage is what we say as raja'ah. Or we say the chapter of ruju. In Malay, we say ruju. Saya ruju balik isteri saya. Saya ruju balik isteri saya. What is the meaning? Meaning this particular person has divorced his wife. And then he asks the wife back to his marriage. As long as the wife is in the waiting period. It's in the waiting period. And you have And inshallah, we will mention what the meaning of idda any after this so he mentioned here when a free man pronounces divorce upon his wife once or twice not thrice so either either once or twice not three times if a man pronounces divorce three times for his wife in this particular situation we say there is no ruju there is no ruju because it is not permissible for him to ask back the wife to his marriage because the number of talaq has all has been used up so we are only talking about in a case that the divorce took place once or twice. So this is what we are mentioning. After previously having had sexual intercourse with her, as what I mentioned earlier, there must be consummation. So maybe we underline this. Because there is no ruju if there is no con consummation. No ruju when there is no consummation. Then if the divorce is not a release for compensation, uh, khulu, as what I mentioned earlier. If it is not a type of khulu, because khulu if divorce is based on khulu, there is also no raja'ah. So there is no raja'ah when there is no consummation. There is no raja'ah when there is, uh, when more than three times of divorce. And then he mentioned, he may take back her at any time before the end of a waiting period. Idda, whether she wishes to return or not. Because now the choice any is up to the husband and not the wife. Sometimes any the husband and he divorced the wife while the wife is in the waiting period the husband felt that he wants to ask the wife back to his marriage in this particular situation it is compulsory upon the wife to what you call it to follow and there is no right any for the wife any to reject this is in a state of we say in raja with the conditions as what we mentioned before this or he may finalize the divorce during this period by pronouncing it a third time. If the husband pronounces a third time, there is no maraja. That's what I mentioned. And then we go down again. When a divorce occurs before the husband has made love to the wife. Or afterwards in a release for compensation from a khulu. Then he may not take her back without remarrying her. So this is in the case of khulu. And in a case when there is no consummation. So there is no raja. Returning to the wife to marriage is only valid by explicitly stating it. Such as by saying, I return her to my marriage. So there must be lafaz, there must be saying. Meaning, I, re I return my, my wife to my marriage. When he say this, now automatically the wife becomes any under, under him again. After the, after the divorce. It is not a necessary condition, but a sunnah to have the return attested by witnesses. We say that it is not compulsory that when you say, I return her to my marriage, there must be witness. We say it is a sunnah yani, for others to witness. But it is not compulsory. Even though yani, there is no witnesses, it is still, it is still valid. Now, when a free man has pronounced a threefold divorce, the divorced wife is unlawful for him to remarry until she has married another husband. In a situation that the husband has divorced three counts of divorce and into the wife, we say that in this particular situation, it is not permissible for him to ask the wife back to return and into his marriage. If the husband wants to remarry the wife, what he has to do is, the wife... The, if the wife married any to someone else and then when the divorce any take place after she has finished the idda provided there is consummation any for the second marriage then only the first husband can remarry the wife this is in a case if she, he has 
divorce the wife with three counts of divorce. If she has divorced the wife with three counts of divorce, there is no hujo and she cannot remarry her. Unless any this particular woman marries another man and there is consummation and then the mind divorce, divorce her and then after she completed the idda, then it is permissible for the first husband to marry the wife again. So this is pertaining to hujo. Now I will talk about the idda to talaq. The waiting period, there are two types in Islam. We have Iddatul Talaq and Iddatul Wafa. We have the waiting period uh, after divorce and we have waiting period after the death of the husband. So when I, when I say Idda, do not be confused. I say Iddatul Talaq, meaning it is waiting period after divorce. Later on, inshallah, we will go to another type of Idda, which is called Iddatul Wafa. This is pertaining to the death of a husband. So at Edda basically we are talking about the Edda to Talaq is post-marital waiting period. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah in verse 2 to 8. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned divorce women remain in waiting for three periods. Kuru. Wal mutalaqatu yatarabbasna bi anfusihim salasata kuru. Wala yahillu lahunna an yaktumna ma khalaqallahu fi arhamihin. In kunna yu'minna billahi wal yawmil akhir. وَبُعُونَتُهُنَّ حَقُّ بِغَدِّهِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ إِنْ أَرَادُوا إِسْلَاحًا وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلِرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ This is a basis pertaining to Iddah and Ujum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, Divorced women remain in waiting. Waiting here is Iddah, Iddah to Talaq. For how long? For three periods. This is a translation for Kuru, the word Kuru. In our madhab, Al-Imam Shafi'i, the meaning of Kuru is three, three clean intervals of menstruation cycles. Three clean intervals of menstruation cycles. This is based on our madhab al-imam, al-imam shafi. It is not lawful for them to conceal what Allah has created in their wombs. And the wisdom behind idda is because to know where, whether there is, uh, what you call it, uh, the, the, the woman is pregnant or not pregnant. That is the wisdom behind why Islam make idda something which is compulsory. And their husbands have more right to take them back. This is the basis we say that the woman got no choice. Meaning it is up to the husband. Whether the husband wants to take back the wife, as, as form of hojo, as what we mentioned, or the husbands want to release the wife. Everything and it goes back to the husband and the wife and he has, has to obey. If they want re uh, reconciliation and due to the wives is similar to what is expected of them, according to what is reasonable, but the men have a degree over, over them in responsibility and authority, and Allah is exalted in might and wise. And then he mentioned, there is no waiting period for a woman divorced without having any sexual intercourse with the husband. This is point number one. There is no idda to talaq if a woman is divorced before consummation. Meaning if a man marries to a woman and then before any sexual intercourse, he divorced the wife. In this particular situation, we do not talk about idda to talaq. There is no idda to talaq at all. Unless if there is consummation, there is sexual intercourse, then only we say it is compulsory upon the wife to have idda to talaq. So those any who are divorced without any consummation, there is no idda. There is no idda. A waiting period is obligatory for a woman divorced after intercourse. So this is point any which is important. After, after intercourse. If the husband was alone with her but did not consummate and then divorce her, there is no waiting period. Meaning there is no idda. When a waiting period is obligatory upon a woman because of divorce and annulment of marriage, fasakh, then she is pregnant. The waiting period ends when she gives birth, provided two conditions of men. Amen. Sometimes the husband divorces the wife in a, in a situation that the wife is not pregnant. If the wife is not pregnant and if she is a, a woman who has menses, then we say that she is in Idda and the Idda ends after three clean intervals of menstruation. But in a situation if the wife is pregnant, then we say that the Idda ends at the end of the delivery. At the end of the delivery. So a person and he can be pregnant and for nine months. So the Idda is nine months. Nine months. So for nine months, the husband yeah, he has the capacity yeah, he to make a decision whether to ask the wife back to his marriage or not to ask the wife back into his marriage. So when there is delivery, when the child is born, then automatically we say that the idda has finished. So the condition is the first that she has to give birth to all she was carrying. So our scholars and Ibn Nakib and they talk about something difficult. He said that if a woman has twins, so the first baby came out. The second baby is still inside the stomach. We say that the idda is still present. So the idda will only finish if all that she is carrying has been delivered. This is a bit, this is a bit technical, Walhasin. 
Point number two, the second condition is that the child is from the husband. Imagine if a woman yani, does adultery in Auzubillah. And then she is pregnant from another man. And then the husband divorces her. And she is divorced in the condition of pregnancy. In this particular situation, we do not say that the idda ends by delivery. But we say that the idda ends by three menstruation cycles or three months. Because our scholars differed whether a pregnant woman, does a pregnant woman has menses? Or a pregnant woman in the sahan menses. In this particular situation, we do not say that the idda ends upon delivery because the baby that she is carrying is not from the husband that divorces her. So that is why we cannot say that the idda is upon delivery, but the idda and it goes back into the to the cycles. The minimal duration of pregnancy is six months, while the maximum is four years. This in the mother Imam Shafi and Imam Malik. If a woman is not pregnant and has menstrual periods. Her waiting period ends when three intervals between menstruation has finished. Later on, inshallah, I will explain exactly what is meant by by Sheikh Ben Al Musri. I actually I draw a table for you. If you can if you can look, there is a table here. So I will explain to you what is the meaning of kuru. How do we ascertain whether the end of a woman has finished or not has finished? So I think we will straight away go back. Uh, we we go to the table. So if you look at the table. I put the table into three categories. The first one I, I uh, place on top is menses cycle. And then below it I put menses, intervals, menses, intervals, menses. The meaning here is the menses, the interval are basically the clean days. Meaning the menses has stopped. This is what I place as intervals. And then the second diagram is the minimum menses and the intervals. Now we are going to talk about what is the minimum edda. What is the minimum idda that can be experienced by a woman? We know that menses, the minimum duration for menses is 24 hours. The minimum duration of menses, 24 hours. The maximum duration of menses is 15 days. So, if you look in this table, I am putting the minimum duration for menses and the minimum duration for intervals. The minimum duration for intervals is 15 days. The minimum duration for intervals is 15 days. So I place here. The next uh, diagram, if you look at the next diagram, ne next page. So now we are going to look into the minimum uh, number of Iddah. Ibn Naqib al Misri, he said that the minimum number of days that a woman can undergo Iddah to Talaq is 32 days and 2 moments. 32 days and two, two, two moments. So how does he get 32 days and two moments? So that is why I draw this diagram. So if you look at this diagram, if you look at number two, the intervals clean. The wife is divorced at the end of this interval. So imagine that the wife is divorced at the end of this particular interval, meaning she is in a clean period. She is going any to the to the, the another stage of menses. So if the wife is divorced at the end of this clean interval, now we consider this first, first clean interval as the first interval. Okay? Altogether, how many intervals? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, يَتَغَبَّصْنَا بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ كُرُوْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned there must be how many clean intervals? Three. So if the husband divorces her at the end of the first clean interval, we consider this first clean interval as a first clean interval. So how many more intervals to go? Two more. So I put down there, divorced. The example here. Meaning this particular woman is divorced in this clean interval. And then the menses is only one day. This minimum duration for menses. And then the intervals come again for 15 days. 15 days is a minimum days for interval. And then number five, the menses come. And number six is the last interval. That is the third interval as I, I, I placed there. After this third interval has finished, when the woman experiences menses, automatically, upon having menses, automatically she is, she has completed her waiting period. So this is how we count the three clean intervals. And this is the minimum. We are talking about the minimum. And the reason I, I explain to you this minimum, if you can understand this, you can understand any, everything any pertaining to the duration any of Edda. You can understand any, everything the, pertaining to the duration of Edda. So there must be three clean intervals. 
Because the thing is, we must understand, my brothers and sisters, is that different women has different number of days of menses. So, one woman, for example, the day of the waiting period can differ from another woman. One woman can have, for example, 33 days in Iddah. Another woman can have, for example, 40 days of Iddah. It depends. Because some women, any number of days in menses are less than other women. So, in order for us to determine whether such a woman has ended the waiting period or not, these are the things that we have to consider. And the minimum is 32 days and two moments. Why two moments? The first moment is at the point of talaq. This is the first moment. The second moment is at the point when the menses come after the third interval. So these are the two moments. How come we get 32 days? So now we, we go back and count again. We add the number three, one day. We add with number four, 15 days. And we add with number five and number six. We will get 32 days. So 32 days and two moments. I saw I mentioned moment. The first moment is at the point of divorce. And the second moment is at the point of menses after the third interval. Then we consider yani, we consider that the woman has finished her idda. Now we go on yani, to talk about idda to wafa. So just now I mentioned about idda to talaq. Now we are talking about idda to wafa. Idda to wafa is when a woman, the husband of a woman passed away. So this waiting period any for a disease. If a woman husband dies, even if be, during the waiting period of a non-finalized divorce, then if she is pregnant, her waiting period ends when she gives birth. So basically, the situation of the woman when the husband passed away can be a different situation. Sometimes a woman, for example, is divorced and then the husband passed away. The woman is divorced and then the husband passed away. Earlier we mentioned that when a woman is divorced, she has to undergo an adda, a talaq. And then while she is undergoing adda to talaq, the husband passed away. In this particular situation, we throw away the adda to talaq and we tell her that she has to observe adda to wafa. And adda to wafa is four months and ten days. It is something which is fixed. as what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. Four months and ten days. And then he said her waiting period end when she gives birth. If a, if a woman, for example, is undergoing any pregnancy, we say that the idda to wafa ends, what you call it, when she gives, when she gives birth. Now, so now that we have the situation now, uh, the husband yani, uh, of a wife passes away. So now she enters into Iddatul Wafa. When, uh, when a woman enters into Iddatul Wafa, there are certain things which is compulsory upon her to do. So later on, inshallah, yani we will talk about that. But before that, the author mentioned here the lodgings of a woman in a waiting period. We say that it is compulsory, point number one, that the husband has to provide for uh, the husband or the, what you call it, the inheritors of the husband to provide lodging for the wife to provide lodging for the wife and this is whether we are talking about idatul wafa or idatul talaq if a husband passes away a woman is in the waiting period whether it is from idatul talaq or idatul wafa she has to remain in the house meaning she cannot she cannot go out of course any with some exceptional cases which inshallah later and we'll talk about it a woman in the waiting period of an unfinalized divorce. What is unfinalized divorce? Meaning this is a divorce that you can take back. Okay, this is in a situation if the, the husband divorced her for one time or two times. This is considered to be talaq raja'i. Meaning the husband is able to return her back to the marriage. If that is the case, he said that a woman may leave, uh, 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 a woman in the waiting period of an unfinalized divorce, Less than threefold divorce is under the husband's authority, authority and may, leave, may not leave without his permission. So in a case of uh, talaq raji'i, an unfinalized talaq, we say that it is compulsory upon the woman to remain in the house. And it is not permissible for her to leave the house. Ex to leave the house. And also it is compulsory upon the husband, compulsory upon the husband to give nafaqah to the wife. This is in a case of an unfinalized divorce. So, nafaka is compulsory, lodging is compulsory, 
and it is not permissible upon the wife to leave the house. This is in a situation of unfinalized divorce. And then he mentioned, if in the waiting period of a finalized divorce, finalized divorce meaning it is a situation where the husband cannot return the wife to the marriage. This is in a situation of khulu, for example. The situation of khulu, compensation in talaq. And also the situation where the husband has used up all the three counts of talaq. Or the situation uh, when the waiting period, any, uh, 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 what you call it, when the, when, when the husband has used all his counts of talaq, we say that it is not permissible for the husband to return the wife back to the marriage. In this particular situation still, we say that it is compulsory upon the wife and it to stay within the house. And this is pertaining to finalize, finalized divorce. So he said that whether it is a finalized divorce or after the husband's death, this is pertaining to Aidatul Wafa, a woman may leave during the day, exceptional case, to fulfill her needs only. We say that it is compulsory upon her to stay within the house unless she is in need to go out of the house to fulfill her needs. So this is different Sani, from Talaq Raja'i. This is the difference between Talaq which is finalized and Talaq which is not finalized. Talaq which is finalized, Talaq which is not finalized, Talaq which is not finalized, it is not permissible for her to go out of the house. But Talaq which is finalized, it is only permissible with condition. It is only permissible for her to leave the house with the condition if she is in need to leave the house for her necessity only. If she is in need and need to find nafaqah for herself. Because we must understand, finalized talaq, there is no nafaqah. There is no nafaqah any for a woman who is undergoing a finalized talaq. Meaning if a husband divorce a woman for three counts of divorce, this is a finalized talaq. Meaning the husband cannot return the wife back to his nikah. In such a situation, it is not compulsory upon the husband to provide nafaqah while the woman is in iddah. So in this particular situation, we say it is compulsory upon her to, to stay in the house but in times that she is in need to find nafaqah for herself for the, for the fact that it is not compulsory for the husband to provide nafaqah for her then in this particular situation it is permissible for her to go out of the house if there is a need meaning if there is a necessity then we say it is permissible for her this is pertaining to a woman who is undergoing a finalized divorce point number two is also applied to a woman who is undergoing iddatul wafa so this is what is mentioned by Sheikh Ibn, Ibn Naqib al-Masri if a woman is undergoing iddatul wafa, meaning because of the death of the husband, it is the same case. We say that it is compulsory upon her to remain at home and it is only permissible for her to go out if there is a necessity to do so. If she wants to find any for her own sustenance, because there is no nafaqah for a woman who is undergoing iddatul wafa, what is compulsory any upon the inheritors of the husband of the deceased is only to provide lodging for the woman who is undergoing iddatul wafa. So pertaining to the nafaqah, it is not compulsory. It is the same as the woman who is undergoing the finalized divorce. So these are the things that we have to understand. We have to differentiate between a finalized divorce and a non-finalized divorce and eddatul wafa. What is the difference? We say that it is compulsory upon the husband to provide lodging, food, nafaqah only for, only for divorce which is unfinalized. If the divorce is, is unfinalized, everything and it becomes compulsory upon the husband. It is compulsory upon the husband to provide nafaqah. It is compulsory upon the husband to provide lodging. It is not permissible for her to go out without his permission. Everything and it, as though and she is the wife of the, of the husband. The only thing is they cannot stay together. They cannot stay together, they cannot stay in the same room and they cannot show their aura and into each other because divorce has already taken place. But she is undergoing any, a non-fundless divorce because at any time, the husband can ask her back to the, to the marriage. Time. The waiting period must take place in the same lodging when, where the divorce occurred and the woman may not move to other quarters. This is basically that we say it is comp uh, compulsory upon her to stay within the house and it is not permissible for her to go out of the house. Whether we are talking about finalized divorce or unfinalized divorce or end of the All these three situations, it is compulsory upon the woman to stay in the house. So it is not permissible for her to go out of the, to go out of the, of the house. If she does so, this is a sinful act. This is ma'asiyah. Uh, if, uh, if a woman does that. And then he mentioned any earlier, uh, further down, it is unlawful for the husband of a woman in her waiting period to be alone with her. It is haram. If a person has divorced any other woman, whether we are talking about finalized divorce or unfinalized divorce, 
it is not permissible for the husband to be with her anymore but it is compulsory upon her to stay within the house it is compulsory upon the husband to provide lodging any for the wife if the house that the husband is staying is small and it is not conducive any for the wife to stay with, uh, in the house it is compulsory upon the, upon the husband to find another house even rented just specifically any for the woman to be in it in her edda and the cost of the rental also goes back any for the for the husband if this is and that if we say that this is a non finance divorce not only the rental cost that the husband has to provide but also the nafaka for the woman the husband also has to provide while she is going undergoing any the the idda طيب now we go on and to talk about ihdad ihdad is only we are only talking about when an iddatul wafa happens so this is the thing that you have to memorize what, what I can say is the term is ehdan is only for iddatul wafa because these are the things some people got confused sometimes maybe you can write this down ehdan is only for a woman who is undergoing iddatul wafa important point ya jamaah important point ehdan is only for the woman who is undergoing Iddatul Wafa. What is the meaning is? You see, some people and they are confused because the word Edda is the same. If a husband divorced the wife, whether we are talking about finalized divorce or non-finalized divorce, talak rajin or talak ba'in, there is no Ehdad. Meaning, if, if a woman, even in the finalized divorce, meaning if the husband divorced the woman for three counts of divorce, this is a finalized divorce, the husband cannot ask, cannot return the woman back to his marriage. In this particular situation, we say there is no ehdan. There is no ehdan. We say that for finalized divorce, ehdan is not compulsory, but it is a sunnah. So this point number two, and if you can write down, it is better. Ehdan is sunnah for finalized divorce. Point number three, write down. Ehdan is not compulsory for an unfinalized divorce. Maybe some of you wondering and what's the meaning of ihdad? Taib now after this inshallah and we will talk about it. Okay, so we have three rulings now. We have sometimes ihdad is compulsory, sometimes ihdad is sunnah, sometimes ihdad is not compulsory. So ihdad is compulsory when it comes to ihdatul wafa. Ihdad is sunnah when it comes to finalized divorce. Ihdad is not compulsory when it comes to unfinalized divorce. Khalas. Okay, now we talk about ihdad. What is the meaning of ihdad? So, in short, I say, I give you an example. Husband pass away. Husband pass away. We say that when the husband pass away, automatically the woman, the, the wife, enters into Iddatul Wafa. How long is Iddatul Wafa? Four months, ten days. Four months, ten days. This is based on the Quran Karim. There is no differences among the scholars at all pertaining to Iddatul Wafa. Four months and ten days. In these four months and ten days, it is compulsory upon the wife to avoid wearing nice clothes so what's the meaning any wearing nice clothes because you see cloth clothings there are some clothings that you go out for majalis for example a woman when he wants to go to a wedding of course any she will wear nice clothes a woman who goes out any she will wear nice clothes she will not anywhere pajamas any outside for example so we, or wear some clothing that she wears any in the house if a woman in a state of adatul wafa it is not permissible for her to wear nice clothing in which she wears outside Point number one. Point number two, it is not permissible for her to wear perfume. It is not permissible for her to wear perfume. It is the same ruling as those who is doing ihram in hajj. So those of you who have learned the chapter of hajj, it, we, we say that it is the same ruling. All the things which is haram for a muhrim in hajj, we say it is haram for a woman in iddatul wafa. This is qa'ida. So it is not permissible for her to wear perfume. She cannot bathe any using soap. There must be no perfume. Any form of perfume while she is undergoing any of this while she is undergoing this endatul wafa so it is not permissible any to, for her any to wear nice clothes it is not permissible for her to wear jewelry it is not permissible for her to wear perfume it is not permissible for her to wear henna it is not permissible any to wear to wear henna and also any it is not what you call it a permissible any for her to wear adornments meaning to, to wear makeup and such 
Meaning anything that a woman uh, wear for the sake of beauty, it is not permissible. Why she is undergoing adatul wafa. So all this, and lastly, Afwan, lastly, it is not permissible for her to go out of the house. Unless, with what we mentioned earlier, if there is a need to. Meaning she needs to find nafaka for herself because there is no nafaka in adatul wafa. Or she is in a state of sadness and she needs to go to the neighbor house for her to express any of her feelings. It is permissible with the condition that she comes back to her house at night and she stay in the house overnight. This is the situation we say it is permissible for her to go out of the house. Other than that, it is not permissible for her to go out. So all this situation is the meaning of ihdad. Remember this. All the situation that I mentioned, this is the meaning of ihdad. And remember, ihdad is compulsory. For woman in iddatul wafa, it is a sunnah for woman in a finalized divorce, ba'in. If a woman any in finance divorce, if she say, I do not want to observe idda, we say there is no, there is no compulsion. We say it is a sunnah for her any to observe, to observe any ihdan. So this is basically the, win, the meaning of what is mentioned basically any in these notes. So I will skip. Now I will also skip the end of the waiting period. This is a bit difficult. It requires any a lot of uh, explanation. So I will skip that. I will straight away go into the chapter of nafakat. Since we have only five minutes. Five minutes before Kim Yenni. So now we go on to our third uh, chapter yani, of our course today. The chapter of Nafakat. I translated uh, something which is important, very, very important. This is mentioned, you, you might want to write this down. It's already there already. It is mentioned by Khatib Ashirbini in his book, Mornil Muhtaj. It is a com commentary on Kitabul Minhaj. You see, a lot of people, a lot of calls, and I get, and sometimes at the most. People ask about nafaka. He say, my husband does not give me nafaka. Uh, and then uh, sometimes the husband say, yeah, I, I give nafaka yani, to my wife. So the wife says, where God? There is no nafaka. So there are people yani, who are confused pertaining to the definition of nafaka. What is the meaning of nafaka? Are we talking about money? Are we saying that, okay, it is uh, just compulsory and it's for you to pay a sum of money yani, to your wife monthly, that is your nafaka? Or we are talking about more than that? So this is a topic that we have to really we have to really ponder and we have to really study. Otherwise, any we cannot understand. We might think any nafaka is such, but actually it is not the nafaka that is defined any by our by our religion. Before I talk about the topic of nafaka, there is something very crucial I, I would like to say. These rulings on nafaka that I am going to mention is only when there is a disagreement. So maybe you can write this down. The rulings of nafaka, write this down. The rulings of nafaka. The rulings of nafaka is only uh, are only applicable the rulings of nafaka are only applicable when there is an disagreement when there is a disagreement between the husband and the wife full stop all of you get this you must get this huh? so i will give you an example imagine a man and a woman got married and said and so the woman said to the husband you do not have to give me nafaka because mashallah i'm rich really imagine a poor man for example and he married to a rich woman wealthy woman she got millions of dollars so the wealthy woman just tell him no i think you provide your nafaka for your own self no problem any i do not need any nafaka is it permissible we say yes it is permissible so the husband and he do not have to provide any nafaka any for the wife and this is agreeable by the wife. This is important. This is agreeable by the wife. So we say that nafaka is the right of the wife. Meaning it is up to the wife. Whether you want nafaka or you do not want nafaka. Or even you say, never mind, you just give me a small amount of money as nafaka, that is enough. We say there is no sin any towards the husband. And there are such any marriage that goes on any outside. That the wife tell me that if you marry me, never mind, I can do my own because I got my own business. I, what you call it, you do not have to provide me anything. So they they, what you call it, they engage in that marriage. So these rulings that we are going to talk about is only when the wife complain and the wife say that you did not give me nafaka. Uh, then only we talk about these rulings. Then we define, okay, what is a nafaka which is compulsory and what is a nafaka which is not compulsory. So uh, all of you with me before we start. All of you can understand. Is any, does anyone doesn't understand what I'm saying? I repeat. Anyone? All can understand. Eh? Type, simple. Okay, now we are going to talk about the types of nafaka, which are compulsory upon the husband. Altogether, how many? If you look at your notes, uh, they are altogether seven. 
Masya Allah. Subhanallah, if you, if, you, if you go through any disguise, any of the wife, you will find that actually Islam honor the woman. See, today, any what we are, we are uh, listening any to the news, BBC, CNN, uh, they, are, they are saying that Islam caused a lot of injustice any to the woman. Wallahi, if, uh, if we Muslims, any we learn about this chapter of Nafaka, later on you will see how Islam any honored any woman. Look at what is compulsory any for the men any to provide the woman. Point number one, which is compulsory upon the men to provide for the woman when they engage in a relationship, is staple food. This is point number one. Staple food depends on where the woman is living. So if you are living in Singapore, the staple food is rice. So daily you have to provide any food any for your wife as a form of staple food. This is point number one. Point number two is not only staple food, but also the things that comes along with the staple food. Gravy. Gravy, fruits, vegetables. So we are talking about the normal custom that a household have in their daily consumption any of food. We have rice and also the gravy that comes along with it in that environment. So for example, any in our country and in Singapore, we have certain any gravies that, uh, what you call it, or certain food or certain meat or certain vegetables or certain fruits that we say that this is something which is we are accustomed to. So in this particular situation, it also depends on the capacity of the husband. If the husband is any arrangement, then he has to provide a, what you call it, a type of food that uh, suits, suits any his capacity to provide for the wife. Is the husband any in the, is in the middle or the husband is poor, then everything goes back to the capacity of the husband. We do not say it is compulsory upon a poor husband to provide what a rich husband any provide any for the wife. But we are talking about his capacity. So it is compulsory upon her to provide staple food for her and also the things that comes around with the staple food. The gravy, the types of food, the types of vegetable, meaning it is something any which is consumed by a normal household in a particular country and in a particular environment. So this is compulsory any upon the husband any to provide for the wife. This is point number two. Pertaining to point number three, it is compulsory upon the husband to provide clothing any for the wife. And all this and it goes back any to the custom any of a particular community. So a woman, for example, she needs clothing that she uses any in the house, in the house. Clothing that she uses any to go to the bedroom. Clothing that she, she needs any when she goes out, out of the house or to attend any to gatherings and so on. So pertaining to the clothing, pertaining to the shoes and so on, everything that a woman needs, for example, for her, you need to go out for her to stay within the house. It is compulsory upon the husband you need to provide for the woman, but not excessively. We are just talking about need to fulfill any the need any of the wife. But if the wife, for example, asks the husband for something more than that, it is not compulsory upon the husband to provide. And this applies any to all the types of things that we are mentioning here. It also goes back any to the capacity of the husband. It also goes back any to the need of the wife. If it is something which uh, uh, access the need of the wife, then we say it is not compulsory upon the husband to provide. But again, we say if the husband wants to still provide the wife with something extra, it is up to the husband. But we say it is not compulsory. Because now we are talking about the law. We are talking about conditions. We are talking about the, uh, what you call it, uh, the technicalities and pertaining to the obligation of nafaqat. This is what we are talking about. And then point number four is the things that is uh, needed for a woman in, his, in her personal hygiene. So if you look at the notes later, I think I, I will not go through the notes because of time, but I will just give you a, a short summary of what I have written. So when we talk about personal hygiene, we are talking about all the things that is needed by a woman to keep herself clean. This is compulsory upon the husband to provide for her. And exceptional and excluding, we say, excluding cosmetics. Cosmetics and medicine is not compulsory upon the husband to provide for the wife. What is compulsory upon the husband to provide for the wife is the, the things that are needed for the wife to stay clean. The things that are needed for the wife to stay clean. Unless if the husband tells the wife need to put on cosmetics, then it is, uh, it is upon the husband that need to provide for the wife. This is pertaining to personal hygiene. And then of course point number five is furniture and utensils. When a man got, got married and to a woman, he must make sure that he uh, provide what you call it, furniture, uh, a bed, cupboard, and so on. All the things that uh, we say that we need in our daily life, in the household, utensils, pots, for her yeah, to do her cooking and so on. Everything has to be provided by the husband. And also he has to provide her with a dwelling house. And number seven is servant, maid. 
it, it, we say that the woman can only uh, ask for a servant if there is a condition if she is a person who used to be served while she is in her father's house so if you marry any someone for example you marry the daughter any of a wealthy man and she is a person who has been served any from young and then you have the capacity to provide any a servant for her she can go to the magistrate and demand any to court that she want a servant and the magistrate can force upon the husband any to get a servant any for her so these are the seven things which we say under the chapter of nafaqat so we, we say that it is only compulsory upon the husband when there is this agreement when the wife asks for her in a situation when the wife says never mind it's okay i do not need anything like what i mentioned earlier then we say there is no problem today in singapore for example husband and wife working it is totally any a different totally a different situation the husband and wife they come to agreement they say okay i, I give you permission any for you to work but maybe I will just provide for you at the end of the month a certain amount of money. Do you agree? The wife says, okay, no problem. You, you, you let me work. You let me go out and find my, uh, what you call it, my money. Then maybe you can just give me a small amount of money. That is enough for me. In this particular situation, we say that the husband has done his, uh, what you call it, uh, his part any for nafaka. Because he is agreeable. He is agreeable any to what? Uh, she is agreeable any to what he has he has offered so the most important thing is all goes back any to the agreement between husband and wife but in in a case where the wife demand then it's a different situation if the months if the wife say that you have not been giving me nafaka imagine the wife go to the qadi and complain that my husband and this is a lot any happen in your society husband did not give nafaka from the time that uh, she she got married any to the husband all the way until the time when she went to the qadi for years she complained and said, my husband has never provided for me nafaka. Now, this is a situation and the magistrate has to calculate. So, based on the seven any things, the husband, the, the Qadi has to calculate, okay, every day, what is the amount pertaining to staple food? What is the amount pertaining to gravy? So, the, the Qadi comes any to a specific any amount and pertaining to the clothing. If, the, if she said that my husband did not provide clothing for me, the, the judge will also put into consideration any the cost for the clothing the cost any for the furniture the cost for the utensil if she said that my husband did not provide for me anything everything will taken into account and if this is a daily basis when it comes to the food not the clothing when it comes to the food because food is daily so in a day how much does it cost for a husband any to give any to the wife pertaining to the food alone then including other expenses pertaining to the personal hygiene pertaining to the clothing pertaining to the furniture pertaining any to all this and you will sum up and it, be, it becomes a debt upon the husband so the judge and he will tell the husband okay this is your debt that you have to provide any for the for your wife and then if the wife any is not happy then and, and the husband unable to pay then it is permissible for the judge to divorce the judge any is able any for the judge to incur one talaq in which any the husband is divorced any from the from the wife but this is only in the case if the wife lodge a complaint but if the wife say never mind alhamdulillah Tawakal Allah, Allah is the one who gives rizq. You say, Masha Allah. So there is no problem. The, the husband gets in peace. Even if the husband passed away, no problem. Any, because the wife agrees. So this is only when there is a disagreement. Now I will talk about the conditions that entitle the wife to support. Now this is also important. We have talked about the rights of the husband. Now we talk about the rights of the wife. When does the wife entitle to get nafaka? So point number one. He said the husband is only obliged to support his wife when she gives herself to him or offers to tamkin. Maybe you can underline this word. Tamkin is an important word. One of the major, we say that one of the main points that becomes the compulsion for the husband to provide for the wife is tamkin. What is tamkin? In short, I say that the wife enable the husband to have sex with her at any time this is the meaning of tamkin understand or not this is the meaning of tamkin if, if she if she is in this particular position then the, it is compulsory upon the husband to provide nafaka for her but if she is in a position that she refuses to have any sexual relationship uh, sexual intercourse any with the husband then nafaka is not compulsory for her now we say that she is no shoes meaning she is disobedient any to the to the husband so this thing about tamkin yani, is very crucial in a in a marriage this is what he said meaning she allows him full enjoyment of a person and does not refuse him sex at any time at, of the night and day 
She is not entitled to support from the husband when she is rebellious, when disobey him. Number two, she travels without his permission. It is not permissible for a wife to go out from his house without permission for her husband, unless, unless there is an agreement. The husband tells the wife, if you want to go to, to your work, you do not have to ask for permission. You can just go out. Now, it is, it is permissible. In any case, if she does not go out, uh, she does not uh, ask permission for the husband, and she goes out, and she knows that this going out is, uh, the husband did not know about his, her going out, and even traveling any worse, and he go to other countries, if she does that without the permission of the husband, she is considered to be rebellious. Now she is. In this particular moment, when she is doing this act, it is not compulsory upon the husband to provide nafaka for her. And even if she go to court, the husband can say that actually she is nauseous. Now she's up. She is rebellious. So the judge will say there is no need any for the husband any to give nafaka any to the, to the wife. But if the wife make tawa after that, come back any to the husband, then everything starts over, all over again. So nafaka is a daily basis. Remember this. Nafaka is based on daily basis. We are not talking about nafaka yani for the whole lifetime any until you pass away. We are talking about daily. When there is ta'ah, when there is obedience in, in a particular day, now it is compulsory upon the husband to find nafaka for that day. Then the next day, and the next day, and so on. She assumed ihram for hajj or umrah. It is, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, compulsory upon her yani to ask permission yani for the, from the husband. Or she performs a voluntary fast. Also, it is compulsory for her to ask for permission, except that if it is a obligatory fast, then no need. So these are the rights any of the uh, wife towards the husband. Very easy, yeah. So which is more difficult, the rights of the husband towards the wife, or the rights of the wife towards the husband? Which is more difficult? We say that it is the rights of the husband towards the the rights of the husband towards the wife. And this is the meaning of Arijalu Qawamun ala Nisa. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that uh, the men they are given responsibilities and over the woman. Because it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it compulsory for the men to provide nafaka for the wife. So this is uh, what you call it, mentioned yani in, the, in the Quran. It is not that the wife is better than the woman. Some people yani, have misunderstanding. Arijal qawamun ala nisa. So this verse shows that man is better than woman. Islam does not say man is better than woman. But Islam said, what did Islam say? He said, "Inna akramakum inna Allahi atqaqum." The best amongst you is the best who has the, is the person who has the most taqwa to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Sometimes a woman is better than a man when she has taqwa. Sometimes a man is better than a woman when she has taqwa. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is just. He does not say that okay, I created any this man. This man is better than a woman. But Allah said, "Inna akramakum inna Allahi atqaqum." But the thing is, a man is not the same as a woman. The responsibilities of the man is not the same as the responsibilities of a woman. So from there we make a differentiation. We do not differentiate a man of a woman by asking which is better. But we say the difference between a man and a woman is in his or her responsibilities. And the closer a person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who perform their responsibilities. Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it compulsory upon them. These are the people who will be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A, a wife will be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when she performs her responsibilities as a wife. And she performs her responsibilities not because of the husband. She performs her responsibilities as a wife because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is another thing and we have to, we have to understand. Today I provide nafaka subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah make it compulsory upon me to provide nafaka for my wife. So I'm making ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A woman who obey her husband, you are not obeying your husband any because of your husband. Do not think that do not think that your husband, yani, what you call it, is someone yani, that you have to, meaning you are doing everything yani, for your husband, everything yani, to please your husband, which we say that it is, we, which we do not deny it, but the intention we say, everything that you do, you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you please your husband, you are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you obey your husband, you are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are obeying your husband, not because of your husband. You are obeying your husband because Allah has made it compulsory upon you to obey your husband. So when you obey your husband, it's ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the thing that we have to understand. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that one of the best gifts that Allah can give to a person is mar'atun saliha. That a man who is blessed by a woman who is pious, that is one of the best gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali bin Abi Talib, when he translated, when he uh, commented on the verse, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhaban 
He said, Oh Allah, give us goodness in this dunya. Imam Ali bin Abi Talib said that goodness in this dunya in pious woman. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to bless you with mar'atun salihah, yani a person who is obedient to Allah, this is a person that it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is the woman that is going to guide you in this dunya and akhirah. This is the woman becomes the reason you enter Jannah. Because these are the women who knows her rights. Today we are living in our society, a lot of us, and we are ignorant. We do, we do not even differentiate any. What is the rights any of the husband? What is the rights of the woman? And we do not understand the wisdom any. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it obligatory upon the woman as such? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making obligatory the man as such? If you were to understand the wisdom behind every obligation, then inshallah, every one of us, any, we will live a life which is pleased by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our marriage and will be blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remember our scholars mentioned that a blessed marriage a blessed uh, what you call it relationship can only come with the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it can only come when the husband obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the wife obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they must understand that they are on a journey on a journey for what? to get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is not any to get benefit any from the dunya we it is not to get the benefit any of the wealth. It is not to get the benefit of honor. But it is for the benefit of akhirah. Everything that we do as a Muslim, Islam taught us that we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I get married because of Allah. I do not get married any because of the marriage itself. But I get married, the first intention I make is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reason why I get married. When I get children, how I want to dedicate my children for Allah. Not any for my dunya. I, uh, if I got married any to a wife, how I can get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with my relationship and with my wife. These are very important notes that we have to understand. The understanding of the purpose of marriage and then also we have to understand the technicalities and the ahkam, the rulings, so that we do not fall into things which we assume is something but it is not. So we have to differentiate any between what is true and what is false, what is haq and what is batil. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah bless us. Maybe I will read a bit more. You, you can turn to page 25. Ibn Akhib al Masri, and he said, Both men and women are obliged to treat each other kindly and graciously. This is the adab between husband and wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, bil ma'ruf. And he treat your wives with ma'ruf, with goodness. And the akhlaq of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Our Prophet treat his wives with good character. And this is something any which is shown by our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is not narrated that our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ever slept his wife or ever beat his wife. It is not narrated even once. So we say that violence and household violence is not from the teachings of Islam. But of course, there are rulings. There are certain rulings as one we, we know from the verses, some of the verses of the Quran, which Allah subhanahu wa taala gives the permission any for the husband to beat the wife. But beating any in the condition any which is very minimal. It is just something you need to remind the wife any of her ob obligations. And there are a lot of conditions any pertaining to it. Inshallah, in the future, when we have time, we will talk about it. But that is only in the case if the wife thinks that by doing so, it will change any... Uh, the husband thinks by doing so, it will change any the attitude of the wife. But if otherwise, then it, that it is not permissible. And then the rest are basically the same. It is not lawful for the wife to leave the house. It is obligatory for the wife to obey the husband in allowing him full uh, lawful sexual enjoyment. If the wife does not fulfill any of the above mentioned obligations, she is termed rebellious, meaning there is no nafaka any for her. And, uh, and then the husband admonishes her. And then if no admonition that does not effect, and then uh, keeps her away from, uh, from uh, by not sleeping in bed with her. And then if keeping her is in fact permissible to, to hit her, if he believes that hitting her will bring her back to the right path. Though if he does not think so, it is not permissible. He's hitting her maybe in a way to that angers her, uh, injures her. And it's last resort to save the family. And then lastly is the, if there is no choice, then the, only the divorce took place. So divorce is basically the last resort. Divorce is basically the last resort. Now, uh, subhanAllah, I forgot something actually. Page 22, if you look at page 22, the diagram. So I think... Uh, uh, because of time, maybe you can look at this diagram. Look at this diagram, and this is basically what we have mentioned earlier: the connection of the uh, different types of divorce. So we stop here, and uh, we will take some of your questions if there is. You can write uh, your questions.
and pass it to me. <coughs> I receive questions uh, doing the registration, but uh, the thing is, uh, most of the questions actually are answered already. Most of the questions I answered any in this in this talk. People ask how we do we treat our wives. Subhanallah, and this is a, a lengthy thing. We say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَعَشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ What is compulsory upon the husband to treat the wife well? And goes back to all the things that we have mentioned and pertaining to the nafaqat. And it is permissible for her to demand her nafaqa from the husband. Other than that, it is compulsory upon the wife and to treat the wife in a good way. So there are no question, huh? Inshallah. Yes. Never mind. You can you can say out. Oh, you want to? We are short of mic actually. Okay. Okay, there, is, uh, there are two questions. The first question is basically, how does a deaf uh, man and he got married? Uh, if he is unable and he to speak. The thing here is, what he can do is, he can use hand signals. He can use hand signals. If, uh, what you call it, uh, the hand signals, and it can be understood any by the witnesses, uh, can be understood by his witnesses, or he can uh, commission another person to do the akad for him. Uh, or he uses any his hand signals, in, in, in a way that people can understand then it is it is permissible and the nikah is valid this is pertaining any to people any who cannot who cannot speak the same any for divorce if a deaf person any divorce the wife by hand signals does the divorce take place we say yes the divorce take place now just like how we say that the akad any is valid also we say that the divorce also take place when a person uses hand signals Type. Another thing that uh, is important, may, m maybe some of you might ask, is pertaining to written SMS and for divorce. A person, there, there is a question who asks uh, my, uh, the husband actually SMS her or send her a message that he divorced. He divorced the wife. Does the divorce, divorce take place or not? The thing here is we must understand. Written divorce, written divorce can only take place when there is an intention. So it falls under the ruling of elusive words. Understand? So, we have to ask the husband, when you send the SMS, do you intend divorce or you do not intend divorce? If the husband send SMS to the wife, I divorce you. We ask the husband, I, do you intend when you say divorce, you really any, that you are divorcing any of your wives? If the husband say yes, I, I divorce, then we say that the divorce takes place. But if the husband say no, actually I do not intend divorce, then we say that the di divorce does not take place. So this is, uh, this is the first question. And then we have, uh, what you call it, the second question. Uh, Subhanallah, what is the second question of one? Okay. Okay, okay. Toy. Now we have this, uh, the issue where a person is uh, having doubts and in the talaq. Earlier, any we mentioned, when a person is in doubt. When a person any is in doubt. If he, whether he has uh, one talaq or two talaq. If he is in doubt, we say that he, we go back any to the conviction. If he is convinced that he given any the first talaq, we say that there is only one talaq. The second talaq which is in doubt is not valid. But now the question is, if the wife claim that he has, what you call it, if the wife claim that he has done talaq, then if the wife any goes to the magistrate, what the judge any will tell the wife is to swear. Then the talaq any can incur upon the swearing any of the, upon the swearing of the wife. Otherwise any, it does not incur. Okay? Sorry. Why is medicine and doctor's fees not part of the nafaka for the wife? Is it not being healthy uh, on the part of the wife, also part of personal hygiene? Medicine is not part of personal hygiene. Medicine is not part of personal hygiene. Medicine is not part any of the uh, staple food or food. 
So that is why any our scholars any they mention it is not uh, within the limits any of nafaqah. It is not within the limits of nafaqah. But the thing here is we must understand there is uh, there is there, there is no harm any for the husband any to provide any medicine any for the wife. If the hus husband does so, we say that it is out of goodwill any from the part of the husband. Uh, but this is based on what our scholars any mentioned from uh, from the derivation any from the text of the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam pertaining to the definition of nafaka. So medicine and cosmetics is not within the definition of nafaka. It is not from the staple food. It is not from the uh, things that comes with it. And also it is not any with uh, personal hygiene in a sense that personal hygiene for the husband. When we talk about personal hygiene, we are talking about personal hygiene that a wife needs for the husband. So cosmetics, any, it is not within the nafaka unless if the husband wants it. If the husband any tell his wife any to put on cosmetics, then it is compulsory upon the husband to provide cosmetics for the wife. The husband is not supposed to maintain her, keep her healthy. It is uh, what you call it. Uh, it is a husband responsibility any to keep uh, the wife any healthy. It is husband's responsibility. It is not permissible for the husband any to make the wife sick. If it is the cause of the husband, the wife is sick, then the, it is upon the husband to provide medicine for her. Now, this is a good question, actually. If the, if, if, if the sickness comes from the husband, imagine any a wife any, is sick and the husband is to be blamed. Because the husband any, does something, anything, that causes any the sickness of the wife. In this particular situation, we say that it is compulsory upon the husband to provide the medication any, for, the, for the wife. And, and the other wife, any, it is not compulsory. But again, and you have to understand. That's why the first thing before I talk about chapter of Nafaka, this is only when it comes to disagreement. But so far, any uh, so far, a husband and wife, any it is a natural thing. And when the wife is sick, any the husband, inshallah, and the husband will provide. But we are talking about the definition of Nafaka, medicine, and it is not within it. A wife's health also contributes to his children's health, especially if she is pregnant. Uh, we, we say that it is compulsory any, for the husband to make sure that the wife is healthy. That's what I mentioned. And when the wife is pregnant also, it is compulsory upon the husband to give nafaka in it to the wife to make sure that the food and everything are good in a way that the wife is healthy and also for the children. This is compulsory. This is compulsory in upon the, upon the husband. And that's what I mentioned. If the wife is sick and because of the husband, then it is, up, it is upon the husband to provide the medication for the wife. If otherwise, it is not compulsory in the definition of nafaka. Five. Any, more, any other more questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you're talking about Eidatul Wafa? When the husband passed away, okay, I understand. Now the question is, uh, uh, the husband and your wife many passes away. The question that she asks is, is it permissible for the husband to go overseas? Uh, on, uh, is it permissible for the wife of the deceased who is undergoing Iddatul Wafa to go overseas to stay at the uh, place of the children, for example, overseas? In this particular situation, we say it is not permissible. What is compulsory upon her to stay at her at the house where she is in? So what can be arranged is the children and stay with her. The only thing that is permissible any for the wife who is undergoing Iddatul Wafa to go out of her house, we say that it is permissible for her to go out of her house to the house of her children. Yes. But it is compulsory upon her to return to the house and stay overnight at her house. At the house which she was she was in. So it is not compulsory any for her to go to other houses. This is the answer. So I believe there's another question as well. Oh, stop. Tired really, I think. Conditions for divorce once who is previously married. Wali is still crucial. Does it have to be in order? What, what I can understand from this question, 
because the question is in short form. What I can understand from this question is a woman who was divorced. Okay? So now, she has finished the end for the, from the first divorce and she wants to get married. So when she wants to get married for the second time, does the conditions of the wali, the guardian, still applies? We say yes, still applies. So if she has a father, for example, then the father is the one who does the marriage for her. So she cannot any uh, marry by herself. So it still applies. This is why I understand any from the question. And then, he, and then she, and they ask, uh, does it have to be in order? Yes, it has to be in order. At any case, if yes, how about if they are not on good terms? So the what you call it, uh, the daughter and the father not in good terms, for example. So is it? Do we say it is still compulsory and upon the uh, the father to be the guardian? Yes, we say it is compulsory for the husband to be the guardian. Meaning, if the uh, if the girl, for example, goes to the court, the mahkamah sharia, and say that I want to get married to this man, the, the the judge will ask, where is your father? So they say, yes, my father is living nearby. So they say, call your father. So the father comes. So the girl say, I do not, uh, what you call it, uh, I do not want my father, for example, any to, to marry me off because there, there is some enmity and my father does not agree with this marriage. At some instances, the father does not, not agreeable. The daughter yet need to marry someone. In this particular situation, we have to ask, we have to, the judge has to find out why is it that the father does not want to marry off the daughter. If it, it is a situation where, what you call it, uh, the father is in enmity any with the daughter despite that the man that she is going to marry is the same kafa the same kafa as what you mentioned kafa and if it is proven by the judge that the father is in enmity with the with the daughter despite there is kafa between the daughter and the person that she is going to marry in this particular situation it is permissible for the judge to marry the daughter on behalf of the father but of course there must be evidence there must be evidence. It cannot be just be accepted any by, by mouse. It has to be investigated. It has to be investigated. So it is not something any which is, which is easy. Taib, I hope uh, what you call it, uh, it is clear, inshallah. Afwan, there is another one, Afwan. What is the rationale for men not to be able to marry a woman and her sister at the same time? The rationale is Quran and Karim. This is mentioned in Surah Al-Nur. So we say, Sami'na wa ata'na. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran that you cannot combine two sisters and in one marriage. We say, Sami'na wa ata'na. Why? Wallahu ala bis sawab. We do not know. Does that mean that the, that the wife of a husband is considered mahram? Wife of a husband. Does the wife of a husband consider mahram? Wife of a husband. No, she is not considered to be mahram. If she is a mahram, you cannot marry in the first place. The wife of her husband is not a mahram. Because mahram means you cannot get, you cannot get married. So you cannot be a mahram. Alhamdulillah. Okay, yes, I, uh, she uh, at the back first, then, then number two, number three. Ayo. Alaikumussalam. Mahram in the form of Al Quran. Okay. Wait, wait. Mahram. What? Mahram. Yes, yes. You are talking about the dowry. Uh, someone and he wants to get married and into a woman, and the dowry is the Quran. Yes. Provided that the the wife is agreeable to it. It can be anything actually. Dowry can be anything. As long as there is value in it. If there is no value in anything, it cannot be dowry. So Al Quran Al Karim, there is value. H how much does it cost any Al Quran today? Uh, at least, Allah Alam, 20, 30 dollars. Yes, it can be. It can be mahal. Provided that the girl is agreeable. Okay, uh, yeah. Salam.
Okay, good question. What is a, a wali, the guardian of a, of a woman, does not fulfill the conditions of becoming a wali? It will go back, it will go to the next uh, in line. So, for example, if the father is fasiq, uh, then we say that it is not permissible for him to become the guardian. So, the next in line, for example, we have to ask, is, is the father's father available? If the father's father is available, does the father's father, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, the condition that he is there? Then we say that it is transferred then to the father's father, and so on and so on, based on the sequence that we mentioned. Next question. Uh, question uh, husband and wife and he goes to Hajj and then the husband pass away while performing Hajj so uh, the question is does uh, is it permissible for the wife to continue the rights of the Hajj we say yes the wife continue with the Hajj no problem continue with the Hajj until she finish, finishes everything then return to her homeland but the end does starts at the point of the death of the husband the end does starts at the point of the death of the husband but it is permissible for her to continue with the Hajj, no problem. So when she finishes her Hajj, she just returns to her homeland and then continue the Ihdad, as what we mentioned. All the rulings and pertaining to Ihdad. While she is in Hajj also, she has to perform the Ihdad. While she is in Hajj. But it is permissible for her to go out and perform the rites of the Hajj, no problem. And until she finishes, then she returns back to her homeland. Yes, permissible. Okay, if there are no more, yes. Is it Quran to be the Maham? I have to understand your question now. The earlier the question asked pertaining to the Quran, the book, the book any as a dowry. We say it is permissible as the book of the dowry. Now, from your question, uh, what I understand is the knowledge of the Quran, not the book. Meaning, the husband say that my dowry is going to be the knowledge of the Quran because he possesses knowledge of the Quran. No, no, no. If in, a, if in a state that the husband that the husband provides the Quran, the book, as a dowry, we say that the marriage agreement is valid. But we say that it is not compulsory upon the husband to teach the Quran and to the wife. We are not talking. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are talking about the uh, validity of the marriage agreement. We say it has got nothing to do with whether the husband teaches the Quran or he does not teach the Quran, unless if the husband make it a point. Meaning he said that my dowry is teaching of the knowledge of the Quran. I said no. Because it occurred during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a companion who is fakir. He does not possess anything. And he wants to get married. And then, imagine any, the wife of the, the family of the wife asks him, So what do you have in your mahar? Your dowry? He said, I do not have, possess anything. Miskin, yani, fakir. But he said, I have the knowledge of the Quran. So I use... My knowledge of the Quran as my dowry for the marriage. And this is permissible. So now we say it is compulsory upon the husband to teach the wife the Quran. If the, if the dowry is a form of knowledge, not if the dowry is a form of the book. Tamam. Yes. I have two questions. First, uh, you said just now if uh, there's a man, then the death of the uh, daughter, he can give, uh, I mean, can Death of the wife or daughter? Death of the daughter. Daughter, okay. Yeah. He can force his daughter to marry someone. Right? You, you are talking about death of the? No, death, death. Dead, dead. dead. Okay, okay, okay. Subhanallah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Force yes, the, yes. With conditions. Yeah. With conditions. yeah. yeah. If let's say the, this daughter is getting like this particular guy, they have the same uh, kafa. Kafa. Yes. Yeah. The dead force her. This is still valid. The dead force her not to marry. Married. To marry. Yeah, but the girl didn't like him. The girl didn't like him. Okay. The people are saying. No. The people are saying. Yeah. Just now they are saying that man is only married up to four, right? two, four women. But if let's say one of the four dies, pass away, if he can still marry another one. Yes, he can. Okay. I, I, I will. Uh, what you call answer the first first. The first question is pertaining to the uh, forced marriage. Uh, the term any forced marriage. You see this this thing about uh, about forced marriage and sometimes it becomes a problem man, for some people who does not understand. Especially non-Muslim. Okay, Toy, the question you ask is a good question. We have a situation where a father wants to marry off any other daughter. 
and the daughter Yani does not like this particular does not like this particular man. In this particular situation, we say that if the daughter is a virgin, it's point number one. If the daughter is a virgin, and and the father, uh, what you call it, uh, is uh, uh, considered any uh, all the conditions any of the uh, of the guardianship and is, is is present in the father. If the daughter is virgin, it is permissible for the father to marry her off to this particular man, with the condition as what we mentioned, just on the four conditions. There must be no enmity. There must be no enmity between the father and the daughter. There must be no enmity between the future husband and the daughter. Two things. So there must be no enmity between the, fa the father and the daughter. No enmity between the husband and the daughter. If there is enmity, it is not permissible. It, if it is proven, if the judge find out that this, there is enmity, the father might not like any the, the girl. So he married her to someone that he, he knows that the girl does not like. It's not valid. The marriage is not valid. So he has to go back to the four conditions. Your second question pertaining to uh, uh, a person has four wives. He divorced the one wife. Is it permissible for him to marry the fifth wife? Uh, the, the another one. Yes. Provided, provided uh, what you call it, the idda is over. Provided everything together is over. Then he is permissible. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam InshaAllah we will keep you informed if there is upcoming uh, classes any on this uh, chapter So anything we will inform you through email Fajazakumullah khairan Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Ashhadu anna muhammad Thank you.